Hello, I'm Lynn Webster. I write under the name L.A. Webster, and you'll find my novel Greenhalen on the Australian Book Lovers website on the fantasy page. Greenhalen is a portal fantasy, one of my favourite subsets of the fantasy genre. The main character is Green Thumb Sarah Martin, who at the age of 26 thinks she has her life together. She lives alone in a small Australian village, tending other people's gardens for a living and her own for pleasure. She has acquaintances rather than friends, and her life is simple, uncomplicated, just the way she likes it, until she's swept away to a world she never knew existed and is forced to come face to face with impossible magic, ecological terrorism, and a band of outlaws who want her to join them on an unlikely quest. Sarah has some huge decisions to make, ones that will not only decide her own future, but maybe the future of the whole of Algarth too. Once upon a time, welcome to Australian Book Lovers, your destination for imagination. Hello and a big warm welcome to everyone and a huge thank you for joining us for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature that spans a whole range of genres to book lovers around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I'm Veronica Strachan, fantasy, memoir and picture book writer, reader, and your co-founder and host for today's episode 16. And I'm coming to you today from Wurundjeri country. And I am Darren Kazanko, science fiction and horror author, passionate reader, co-host and co-founder of Australian Book Lovers. And I'm coming to you today from corner country for this fabulous, fantastic and jam-packed episode number 16. It is absolutely jam-packed, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, listeners, strap yourself in. This one is going to be a uh, very fun ride. Yes, absolutely. most definitely. But 16, Veronica, I think uh, that means yes. ABL podcast is allowed to whack their little L plates on. Ah, yes, indeed it is. Indeed it is. In most states, I think, and in some states you're allowed at 15, but certainly Victoria, 16. Or yes. 16, nine months. It's been so long since I've had to sit in an L plate no supervised and driver's seat. <laughs> But the main but anyway, thing is we're getting closer to adulthood as a podcast. That, that, that's, yeah. that's very exciting. Yeah, definitely. And we're over 750 downloads. I haven't looked for a little while, but lots of people are enjoying the sessions and listening to all of the bits and pieces, news and reviews and readings by authors, the interviews with authors and with industry experts. So, yeah. But this episode a little bit different we feel we might have drifted a bit towards the author so we're trying to drift back towards our readers and give them an action packed action packed information packed i've been too busy doing editing on family secrets which is our action packed romance thriller supernatural thingy but now back to readers yes. have you got some news for our readers darren uh, absolutely so <laughs> uh, without further ado let's jump to some news And yes, so time for a little bit of news. And and as Veronica, you mentioned so kindly before, uh, we, uh, you know, obviously the podcast is a living, breathing entity and we are very much learning as we go. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, I can tell you all that there is so much to learn. So that's, that's an understatement to say the very least. But nonetheless, the, the goal is and always will be uh, to present, you know, fantastic entertainment and very balanced way for both book lovers and for authors. And obviously for those people who may be a book lover and potential author out there. Yes. So for news this week, I thought I would uh, just put a bit of a spotlight on a couple of the new books that are on the website. And, and that's something we'll be doing regularly so that uh, all of our wonderful, passionate, book-loving readers out there will get an idea. And you, you never know, we might, uh, we might perk your ears up with a great title that sounds right up your alley and then inspires you to go out and chase this title. Yes. So, with it, so why not? I will jump straight into a couple of titles. Uh, I'm going to okay. begin with a fantastic one that's come through, and it's by an author by the name of Lachlan Walter. 
Now, very striking cover art. And if you are, I guess, a monster fan or perhaps uh, got a little bit of a soft spot for Godzilla or creatures of that <laughs> uh, magnitude. Now, we know which one of the uh, hosts has the, you know, the penchant for something not quite nice like that, don't we? Well, yeah, look, I've got a soft spot for monsters. Uh, and, uh, you know, I did go and see Godzilla vs. King Kong. So, uh, yeah, oh, there I, are. yeah, I do like Godzilla a little bit. But, <laughs> no, this uh, book is by a gentleman by the name of Lachlan Walter, and it's called Kaiju. We call it Monster. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking it may even just be called We Call It Monster, uh, but nonetheless, it's a bit of a, it sounds really intriguing. Uh, I'll read the blurb or synopsis for you. And again, if it's uh, if Monsters is your jam, I think this is going to be one book you really want to check out. Mm -hmm. One ordinary day, everything changed. An enormous creature dragged itself out of the ocean and laid waste to a city. In the months and years that followed, more and more creatures appeared until not a single country remained untouched. At first, people tried to understand and accommodate them, and then they tried to fight them. In the end, all they could do was try and stay alive. A story cycle slash novel in stories, we call it Monster, is told in a grounded and realistic way, with each chapter unfolding from the perspective of a different character and detailing their experience of the conflict between humans and monsters. It is a story of forces beyond our control and of immense and impossible creatures that make plain how small we really are. Herein lies the story of our fight for survival and our discovery of that which truly matters. Community and compassion, love and family, hope and faith. Now that is We Call It Monster by Australian author Lachlan Walter and that title it can be found under our science fiction genre. And what an interesting sounding take on what is traditionally, um, you know, a monster story. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I think it's uh, very cool. So I, I've actually reached out and uh, tried to organise to purchase a signed copy of that one. So ah, if you listen to this uh, podcast, Lachlan, I'm waiting for your reply. <laughs> so, uh, now, uh, the next one I'd like to do a little bit of spotlight on is an author I'm guessing a lot of people may already be familiar with, and that's T uh, Tabitha Bird. Mm. And Tabitha Bird, now I know you did a review of this book, um, but I'd like to just let Alyssa know about a little bit about Lifetime of Impossible Day. Mm, so, it. yeah, it does sound really awesome. Um, so, Tabitha Bird, Lifetime of Impossible Days. Meet Willa Waters, aged eight, 33, and 93. On one impossible day in 1965, eight year old Willa receives a myster mysterious box containing a jar of water and the instruction, one ocean, plant in the backyard. So she does, and somehow creates an extraordinary time slip that allows her to visit her future self. In 1990, Willa is 33 and a mother of two when her childhood self appears in her backyard. She's also a woman haunted by memories and is on the brink of a decision that will have tragic repercussions. In 2050, Willa is a 93-year-old whose memory is fading fast. Yet she knows there's a warning she must give her past selves. If only she could recall what it was. Can the three willers come together to heal their past and save their future? Yeah, such, a, such an awesome premise there. Uh, it's just wonderful. fantastic. I would so love to have that little time slip to let my younger self know. And also, I think equally important is to let my older self remember to play and remember to use imagination and that Every day the sun's going to come up, no matter what things have happened in your day, it's going to come up again tomorrow. Yes, yes. But play is yeah. important. And I think even when you're making your coffee in the morning, uh, whether you're in your boots or your socks, um, just remember the cracks between the tiles are hot lava. <laughs> and you must make it in and out with coffee in hand <laughs> without setting yourself on fire. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Very good, very good. But that is that is a beautiful book. I haven't read Lachlan's, uh, but uh, that Tabitha's uh, Lifetime of Impossible Days is just, it's almost, you think it's contemporary until you start to read it and the magic just slips in ever so subtly. I just love it. It was beautifully written. Hmm. Yeah, look, I, I've obviously I haven't read any of Tabitha's works, but reading the synopsis slash uh, blurb, mm -hmm. it, do, it definitely comes across with a almost dreamlike quality. Yeah, uh, like perhaps you know, magic and dreams slipping into reality. Well, obviously there's yeah. a little bit of magic involved, but yeah. but I, I thought I'd illuminate Tabitha's other title that is 
under uh, uh, listed on Australian Book Lovers. And both of these titles can be found under our contemporary genre with our fantastic dolphin, mm-hmm. who is yet to be named, so that will change in the future. <laughs> um, but the other book we'd, I'd like to uh, highlight is Tabitha Bird's The Emporium of Imagination. I understand you've read that one as well, Also, Veronica. yes. Yes. <laughs> So, I'll just sit here quietly fangirling, you know, going, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think this may, you know, hopefully uh, generate a few more fans out there because if you haven't read any of Tabitha's work, I think some, a description like the following is probably going to make you start clicking and looking. So from the author of A Lifetime of, of Impossible Days, and which, by the way, was winner of the Courier Mail People's Choice Queensland Book of the Year Award, comes a beautiful and uplifting story that will make you laugh and make you cry. Welcome to the Emporium of Imagination a most unusual shop that travels the world offering vintage gifts to repair broken dreams and extraordinary phones to contact lost loved ones. But on arrival in the tiny township of Boona, the store's longtime custodian, Erlitage Hubert Umbre, makes a shocking realisation. He is dying. The clock is now ticking to find his replacement because the people of Boona are clearly in need of some restorative, restorative magic. Restorative is a bit of a tongue twister for me. Go figure. Uh, (laughs) Like Enoch Rain, a heartbroken 10-year-old boy mourning the loss of his father while nurturing a guilty secret. Like Anne Harlow, who has come to the town to be close to her dying grandmother. Though it's Enoch's father who dominates her thoughts and regret, even Erlitage in his final days will experience the store as never before and have the chance to face up to his own tragedy. So prepare to immerse yourself in wonder, childish delight and dark, dark trauma in this unique novel from a new and important Australian literary voice. And that's a quote from Australian Women's Weekly on A Lifetime of Impossible Days. But so there you go. A Mm. very, very uh, powerful ride by the sounds of it. Someone who can really tap into imagination and uh, bring uh, and and tug on the heartstrings as well. Yeah, most definitely. And to be able to discuss grief in such a a sensitive and, and thoughtful way bringing a little magic and a, you know, just hope into the story. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Beautifully written again. And, and, and very beautiful covers too. Oh yes. Really lovely covers and listeners keep listening because we have recorded a interview with Tabitha, which is coming up in still a few episodes. Cause as you know, we got inundated when we first began, uh, but we have a lovely uh, chat with Tabitha coming up. Uh, which was recorded just before the Emporium of Imagination was released, or just as it was released, uh, which is fantastic. So it's Lots of entertainment still coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once again, uh, that was by Australian author Tabitha Bird, and both the titles, Lifetime of Impossible Days and The Emporium of Imagination, can be found under our contemporary. They're actually the, the first two listings at the moment under contemporary, so no, no uh, difficulties finding those. So, or, like, of course, you've got. We have got our search function. So, of even course. though there, if you see anything else, don't forget the search function is there, and you can just type it in and find the book that you want or the author. Yeah, even if you only know the first word or just the first name of the author, it yeah. will get it there for you. Yeah. Now here's a little bit of a, something different. This is by a Australian author by the name of Rita Lee Chapman. Now, this is a title that you're going to find under our Aussie Tales, and it's called Winston. A horse's tail. Oh. Now, I may be a lover of all things horror and sci-fi and dystopian and science fiction, but I also know there's a lot of people out there that absolutely love animals and horses. So if you are a horse lover, I'm, I myself, I'm a little bit scared of them when I go near them. They're just so big. And, uh, they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With minds and hooves of their own. Absolutely. <laughs> but they're <laughs> magnificent creatures, though. No two ways about it. But uh, so if you are a horse lover, then... Maybe Winston, A Horse's Tale, is going to be your very super special jam. So this uh, synopsis reads, one for the horse lovers, sorry, one for horse lovers. Winston is a good-looking Palomino horse whose life involves several different owners and many adventures. As you read his story, told by Winston himself, you will appreciate horse ownership from the horse's point of view. Born on a country property in Australia, Winston tells of his breaking in and education and the different people he encounters. Good bad and ignorant. As well as his own story, Winston includes the experiences of other horses he meets along life's way. Whether it's jumping, eventing, hunting, or just hacking, well, I can't imagine Winston on a keyboard hacking, but uh, I'm assuming that word means something else in (laughs) horse land. So whether Uh, it's uh, hunting or just hacking, (laughs) Winston tries hard to please his rider. Follow his successes and his failures from his breaking in to his show jumping win. 
It is an event for life, the story of one Australian horse out of the thousands, but one that you will remember. And once again, that's Winston, A Horse's Tail by Rita Lee Chapman. We discovered under Aussie Tales. And no, uh, uh, prior to what I might have thought, it's not about a horse with a secret ability of hacking computers. <laughs> no. Well, that can make an interesting to it, it. It could, but here, I've just looked it up for you. Why is it called hacking a horse? So it's believed the word originated from Hackney, Middlesex now absorbed into London, an area where horses were pastured. So these animals were called hacks as a contraction of Hackney and was originally used to describe an ordinary riding horse, particularly one for hide. So Wow. So and it's is that like I guess taking the horse, yeah, for light exercise. Well, that is a bizarre piece of trivia that might have uh, <laughs> because I'm wondering if that means um, where does the you know, for example, is he a good rider? Ah, oh, he's a bit of a hack. Yes. Yeah, well, there goes. There so you go. is that the origins of that word there? Yeah. yeah. So it, it, we uh, would hopefully look forward to chatting with the author who will then give us a lot more information and uh, we will learn so much more about horses and hacking uh, as we have learned so much more about so many things yes. chatting to our authors. And, of course, the preferred software for the horses. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Moving no, pasture, on. pasture. <laughs> pasture, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is just a couple of the fantastic titles you can find on this listed on the Australian Book Lovers uh, website. So we're going to be yeah. bringing you a whole heap more. And uh, next news, we hope to bring you some of the uh, bestsellers from 2020 and as well as some of the current bestsellers from 2021 by Australian authors mm. just so that we can start to really uh, let people know about all of the amazing titles out there obviously not just the titles that we're lucky enough to host or list on our website mm. which is growing every day but by all yes. Australian authors but uh, for this because we've got such a big episode today I am going to switch the microphone over to you now. All right so very quickly just a little uh, update for our reader listeners, which is often our author listeners as well, and many of them will find themselves on Goodreads. So Goodreads was started in 2007, uh, launched by, oh, I think it was a brother, sister pair, Otis Chandler. And I'm just going to read about who we are. So Goodreads is the world's largest site for readers and book recommendations. Their mission is to help people find and share books they love so you could say in in some ways that they're doing a global uh job uh, you know and even more so of course much more complex than what we're doing with australian book lovers so these are a few things that you can do on goodreads you can see what books your friends are reading you can track the books you're reading have read and want to read or you can create your own shelves you can check out your personalized book recommendations uh, and their recommendation engine analyzes 20 billion data points to give suggestions tailored to your literary tastes. And you can find out if a book is good fit for you from the community reviews. So you don't have to have spent money uh, on books as some of the other review uh, channels do. Like if you're on uh, Amazon, you need to have spent a certain amount on Amazon to be able to leave a review. But on Goodreads, you can leave a, re a review on any book that you've read. What I love about it for me, I've been a member since 2014, is that I can put down the books that I have read. And if I'm missing a book in a series, I can go back and see it. I have it on my in the library. I've got a shelf that says that. And so that I know if I'm trawling secondhand stores for old sci-fi series or whatever, I can remember which book that I'm missing. And it's also interesting for the little conversations that go on about books between readers. So it's definitely a site for readers. You can see what people are thinking about the books. There's, you know, the good, the bad, and the in-between. You can see a little uh, written interviews with authors. You can, you know, browse all the categories and those kind of things. You can join groups. There's a stack of groups. There's discussions. There's quotes. There's ask the author. There's trivia, if trivia is your thing. Uh, quizzes, creative writing, all sorts of things uh, that can go on. So this is a, a very helpful suit, a uh, very helpful suit, sorry. <laughs> this is a very helpful site. I was just reading the current trivia, which is in Rick R. Reed's novel Caregiver, main character Dan is a bit thrown when his new AIDS buddy answers the door wearing, number one, his birthday suit, number two, a little black dress and pearls, number three, bunny slippers, or number four, a scarlet kimono and white kabuki makeup. So that's where suit jumped into my brain. So, sorry okay. that. <laughs> excuse There's me on a that one. Of consciousness. Absolutely, but <laughs> and I can't answer you that question. <laughs> no, I haven't read the I haven't read the book, so I don't know. 
So as to how big it is now, Goodreads is this, you know, the, the, they call it a social cataloging website. And while it was started in January 2027 by uh, Otis and Elizabeth Chandler, and then, you know, within 12 months, they had 650 members and 10 million books. So that's pretty amazing. So it was obviously hitting the mark and people absolutely wanted to see what was out there. And then in 2013, so this is um, six years later, Amazon acquired Goodreads. And in 2019, the site had 90 million members. That is massive. So look, I'm going to say it's a little bit like, yeah, well, it, it is. It's social media for for readers yeah, because yeah. there's there's to and fro, and you can follow authors, and you can see when bits and pieces are out there. There's used to be giveaways and things. I haven't seen giveaways for a while, so that might have changed, perhaps um, you know, in the more recent times. But worth having a look at if you are a reader, even if it helps you just to catalogue the books that you've read. So you can go, yeah, I read it. And there's a challenge which I do every year, which is to try and read a certain number of books and um, whether that be three or 30 or 100, whatever you like to do, you can jump in. There you go. So that is my news. Oh, I did want to just say one more thing is mm -hmm. that one of my favourite books for this year, which is The Yield by Tara June Winch, has actually been, um, someone's going to make a movie of it, I can't remember what that's called, uh, what do you call it? When, oh, optioned. That's right. So the yield has been optioned for screen. So you might remember that um, this is the book that talks about, has the, the beautiful language in it, Aboriginal language oh, in right. it. Oh, right. Yes, of Yeah. Course. And it's the, it's the uh, grandfather talking to the, the young girl who's been in London and comes home and he's dying. And yeah, it's fantastic. Really good. So that will be good to see. Don't know who they're going to star in it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there you go. Well, hopefully it's fast turnaround. Uh, but you know, well, yeah. Well, yeah. How you know. fast turnaround is movies, our movies? Oh, well, it depends on how guaranteed they are making money, I think. No, no, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, I think it's a case of how long is a piece of string, but obviously depending yeah. on whether it's going to be prime for cinema, cinema release or whether it's, uh, you know, for streaming. Uh, but I guess, yeah, you yeah, know, so you'd think nowadays it'd be, you'd want a pretty fast turnaround, especially if it's a timely, in the sense of the book's popularity. Yeah, uh, there's nothing worse than finding out. Well, I'm still waiting for the uh, movie version of Shantaram, which was had already been optioned back 20 years ago. Now uh, I think okay. when I first yeah. read the book, and <laughs> you know, soon to be a motion picture starring Johnny Depp, and I thought, well, I don't yeah, know about Johnny Depp doing the role, yeah, but the no, movie could be fantastic. Yeah, um, and of course, it never, it never happened. So <laughs> there's nothing more frustrating <laughs> than having a carrot dangled like that. But uh, but no, yeah. no, fingers crossed, it does turn around because sounds like yes. it'd be a fascinating movie, and obviously yeah. it sounds like a wonderful read too. Yeah, look, absolutely. And the typecast entertainment have got it. So this is Tony Briggs and uh, Damien Pradia. So they produce the Sapphires um, and the screenwriter who they've got to because, of course, you know, a book is a book, but it's not a screenplay. Um, and uh, the person, Cody Bedford, who uh, I don't know if you've watched Mystery Road with the fabulous uh, Aaron Pedersen and many other great Australian uh, actors, that person, uh, Cody Bedford, obviously wrote the screenplay along that. So they are going to do that. So, yeah, really good. So it, it is an important and powerful story about language and relationships and, and uh, Aboriginal culture. So looking forward to it, readers. Indeed. Get out and read it before the movie comes out or the series, whatever it is. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. And that was our news for this episode number 16. <laughs> a little bit shorter because, wow, the guests we've got coming up for the interview. Uh, look, I, do you know what? I'm not even going to say too much because it really, it, it's up the, for the listener there. You just got, you're in for one hell of a ride. Let me just say yes. that. Uh, this gentleman has worked in various different roles, uh, basically around the world. And, you know, has worked a lot in literature, has worked in history, has worked in film and uh, film archiving. Um, right through to comic book shop. He writes fiction. He writes nonfiction. He can tell you about dinosaurs. He can tell you about fauna uh, and a whole range of other things. And honestly, it's a matter, you know, I feel like I need my stubber ticket. Like everyone, like, pass your tickets, please. And I'll <laughs> check. All right, here you go. Enjoy the ride. Strap yourself in. <laughs> That's, uh, so please let me punch your uh, virtual ticket dear listeners, uh, and make sure you put that seatbelt on tight because it is an incredible ride. But nonetheless, it um, did inspire Veronica, us to both 
have a bit of a peek into a little bit deeper into gothic literature being that gothic well gothic literature gothic stories play uh, somewhat of a part in mr phil hoare who is the author that's coming up uh, uh play a, a, a somewhat of a part in at least one or, or one of his novels to we begin talking about which is the brotherhood of the dragon which is just one of his books that you'll discover by this author which you can find under our horror and fantasy section here on the australian book Brothers website but yes um so gothic literature i mean prior to this little bit of research that we've done veronica were you aware of how what that term meant as far as from an australian perspective well, not really. So it, for me, Gothic always felt like it was kind of, you know, Dracula and Bram Stoker and the associated with the Gothic architecture, which in some ways it is. But tell me what you found out and I'll tell you what I found out. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, I guess, obviously, uh, I, I think very similar in the sense of when I think of Gothic, I think of castles, I think of, mm. you know, that, that uh, predominantly, you know, that, that particular sort of English architecture of, you know, moats and uh like gargoyles and yes. candlelight and i guess an early eight, sorry 18th century early 19th century style uh also obviously ghost stories and uh, whatnot but as far as the australian gothic it was really interesting so first i guess i, I just want to read a very short excerpt from a article by a lady by the name of rosalind moran who i mm -hmm. think captured it quite nicely and that is gothic literature can be broadly defined as writing that explores themes of horror the macabre and sometimes romance through narrative devices such as melodrama and suspense. Works in this genre exude an atmosphere of mystery, fear or dread, and typically against a menacing or darkly picturesque backdrop. Now, the backdrop part will come in important later. Consequently, while the genre's European origins invite connotations of Transylvanian castles, which we were just mentioning, or gloomy houses on Yorkshire moors, so now got all the misty and yep. stuff, so settings that embody Gothic literature in pop popular imagination, such wintry locations are not essential to the genre itself. Gothic motives include psychological drama, supernatural threat, mystery, haunting, and wild destabilizing settings. These were motives Europeans historically associated with Australia, and to some extent still do, which is very interesting. The mm -hmm. Australian Gothic thus emerged in part because Gothic frameworks lend themselves to communicating the Mali and dislocation of colonial experience. Now, some early examples of the genre include Marcus Clark's 1870 serial, His Natural Life, mm. and Rosa Prade, I think is the word, uh, how you pronounce her name? Rosa Prade's 1893 novel, Outlaw and Lawmaker. Now, and of course, along with a raft of derivative fiction that sensationalized life in the so-called New Land. So that was an article by Rosalind Moran, Mm -hmm. Some other famous Gothic tales, as far as Australian-based, um, that might jump out to most, re uh, most book lovers and, and authors and fans out there, uh, Gothic tales include For the Term of His Natural Life, so uh, 1874 by Marcus Clark, The Bush Undertaker, which is uh, from, nine, 18, sorry, from 1892 by Henry Lawson, and Wake in Fright, which is a mm. 1961 publication by Kenneth Cook, and Picnic at Hanging Rock, of course, 1967 by Joan Lindsay. Which now, that's just up the road from me, I must say. Oh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> Time to go and see if it is spooky. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a beautiful place, not spooky. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, some, so some of Australia's most complex modern Gothic literature uh, addresses basically the injustice or the explorations of Indigenous Australian and settler experiences and injustice. Injustices, sorry. Um, so some of the more modern, what they call in complex modern Gothic literature, including uh, a book called The Secret River, which is from 2005 by mm. Kate Greenville or Grenville. Yeah, I saw that one too. I was surprised that that was, yeah, a gothic because I, I must admit I did start to read that but couldn't quite get through it as yet. I'll put that away for another day. Oh. Um, but, yeah, it, uh, it was very dark and maybe that was just not the right time. And I find that sometimes if I've read too many dark ones, I need to stop and read something light and frivolous like paranormal romance or oh, something I you were to get me, me political back. news no, oh no <laughs> heavens above that these days oh, and most days that's a little bit depressing but yes that's interesting isn't it yeah yeah well two other books that i'm not familiar with overly uh a title called sorry from 2007 by gail jones mm -hmm. and there's also a title called taboo which is from only a couple of years ago 2017 and that's uh, by kim scott so those three mm -hmm. titles in particular i understand are noteworthy for the fact that they explore 
you know, that those colonial days and the darkness of those days, the injustices, and obviously the really fractured and difficult relationships that were, that were forced to bubble to the surface. But the interesting thing out of all of that for me was rather than, it, it sort of highlighted that a, a natural setting can be Gothic. Yeah. And yeah. with that uh, sense of foreboding danger or possible danger or, you know, uh, unknown elements that can seep into you every moment because, you know, and it, it's a beautiful thing. So in my mind now, when I think there's two Gothics. So I think there's obviously, you, you, it's the standard Gothic, for example, mm-hmm. your castles and your candlelight. Mm-hmm. But then there's the, I, I, in my head, I'm going to think of it as daylight Gothic, which is Australian Gothic because, mm. you know, out in the remote bush, and I can just imagine back in those colonial days, that, that sense of foreboding, dread, mystery would happen during those daylight hours. You Everything know, with, looks so unfamiliar. Yeah. It just and, and create that sense of tension all the time. Possible mm. monsters still out there, animals you've never seen before. Mm. You know, all this. So very, very interesting and it makes me want to maybe go through and, and find some titles that along those lines because there's, I think anyone would agree when you, if you do a lot of bushwalking or, you know, you travel around a bit um, and, and see different uh, different faunas, different areas, you know, desert, semi-desert, semi-arid, tropical, subtropical, ocean, uh, mountainous range. It, you know, you'll come across areas that have a particular energy. Mm-hmm. And sometimes energy isn't dangerous or dark so much, but it can be somewhat unsettling. I don't yep. know what it is. It's something, yep. uh, maybe there's something primeval as in something so antiquitous, something so old and wise and ancient. There's just, a, there, there can be just areas that have that, that overbearing energy where you definitely feel like a visitor, you know, someone who's stepping into someone else's or something else's space. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, so I could just imagine, you know, the, the imagination running wild, you know, in the early colonial days, yep. you know, where, when this, a lot of this literature sort of began of trying to find your place on, on this land um but, so very interesting so yeah gothic australian gothic sounds like it uh, very much has a strong place for our bush and you know or our natural landscape as a background yes uh, yeah and then ov- and obviously also features prominently some of the the real difficult situations uh, between the settlers so to speak and and obviously the the aboriginal population and yep. that in itself brings that human element, that human horror, that human mystery and darkness, sense of foreboding to what is already can be, or what is already being described as a natural Gothic foreboding place. So yeah, very, mm. very uh, interesting, very cool. And I don't know, that kind of almost sounds a little bit more unsettling than the idea of a candle in a castle now. <laughs> that, seems well, so old, that seems so like trivial. Uh, like, yes. Yeah, yeah. indeed. <laughs> And you have covered lots of the information that uh, that I spotted as well, which is interesting in itself. And, you know, leaving aside all the, the European stuff that people were standardly looking at, there's an even smaller genre called Tasmanian Gothic. Ah. Uh, yeah, and that's set exclusively on the island of Tasmania. And I think, did you mention Gould's Book of Fish? I think that uh, Richard Flanagan, so he must be a Tasmanian no. writer. There you go. The Roving Party by Rowan Wilson. And what the uh, the entry that I had a look at is that the theme reflected in European Gothic system and mysterious rituals and traditions. But if you add those mysterious rituals and traditions uh, of Australians, of Tasmania's Indigenous Aboriginal inhabitants, and then, it, as you say, it lends itself to entirely different Gothic things. So elements of Tasmanian Gothic art and literature, um, rustic spirits uh, and the fairy, a fairy as in F-A-E-R-I-E, merging with those traditions can create fabulous worlds for some of these gothic horror, scary, you know, books to be uh, written. So as you say, the, the, you know, the landscape from Australia can be seen as gothic. So yeah, very interesting. The, each country also appears to have its own, uh, each island. So New Zealand um, has a, a number of gothic traditions that have been, you know, developed uh, either New Zealand Gothic or Maori Gothic. We've talked about Australian uh, Canada uh, has Southern Ontario Gothic. So again, it adds that Canadian cultural context. So it's almost as if, and of course, you know, the fabulous Margaret Atwood uh, is in there, Robert Davidson, Alice Munro, um, lots of fabulous people. And then 
some of the writing transferred to movies such as, you know, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, which was a little spooky, um, and all of those just slightly on edge. As you say, you get that energy that feels a bit scary. Some of the new ones, um, an environmental gothic, an eco-gothic is is starting to come up which kind of matches a little bit what we spoke uh, about what we've just spoken of in terms of the Australian landscape so those gothic subgenres are ecologically aware gothic engaged in dark nature and ecophobia so you know suggest that gothic is kind of uniquely positioned to speak to the anxieties about climate change and the planet's ecological future so um, it's almost as if some of the some of the fantasy, some of the sci-fi, some of the contemporary, some of the history, all of it with that edge of modern horror could sit under that Gothic banner. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I, it, that raises an interesting question because, which I wish I had looked into now, is, and the, the question being, is Gothic literature bound to a certain time frame? Doesn't appear to be. So yeah. it's kind of going on. I, yeah, I mean, yes, it it started, you know, back in the the early days in in Europe and all those kind of things. But yeah, it, people are embracing modern gothic. So <laughs> there are well, lots I of suppose, people out yeah, there. Yeah. I just had uh, flashbacks to my old band days where we'd finish a show and go to another venue and realised we'd stumbled into a gothic venue. Oh well, <laughs> yes, of course. We haven't even touched on the goth subculture and and those kind of things. So that's we want to get onto Phil's interview. So uh, yes, but before, we'll leave it there. Yep. Yes, oh, he's got more. I, I I do because I it just got me thinking with the you know with the uh, our gothic horror it seems the you mentioned like obviously the European and and the American and the Canadian have their mm -hmm. own sort of their their gothic sources and beginnings but mostly by the sounds of it that's actually emerges from a time where society is quite established already whereas I'm wondering if Australian gothic the the stuff that is set in the colonial times or when mm -hmm. when our original Australian gothic began to be penned mm -hmm. for uh, down on paper. I'm wondering if that it, ours is a very unique, it has to be a unique one because the society is being built back then. And so the idea every day European really is society. a survival. Well, society, as in the settlers um, that, that, right. that, that were telling the stories, yeah. um, they weren't, you know, it wasn't like they landed in their city. So the, a lot of the families, uh, people were living in a time, uh, back then it was still survival every day whether it be finding yeah. food or you know and there's no protection there's no because they're on their own in this faraway land and they still don't know anything about the land yeah uh, so it does it have to be oh, i see what you mean so while people are embracing that modern horror i guess there's is it truly gothic so i was even thinking just about um you know looking up uh, kim scott for example so um kim's uh, an aboriginal author from perth uh, in WA for those people, international folks who are listening to us. So one of his uh, books called True Country, it was about, oh, was it, was that the one? So one that talks about, so the Noongar people, the British settlers and American whalers. So again, it was back in that time, oh, the dead man dance. There you go. So that's the fascination between those three cultures. Yeah, interesting that it may be required to be as we heard from Greg Johnson, uh, at least 50 years in the past before it's historical fiction. I wonder if that also applies to Gothic fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Something uh, to go down the rabbit hole over a coffee at uh, two in the morning when I can't sleep. Thanks yep. for a nightmare or two. I'll, I'll yeah. start jumping down. <laughs> or if Gothic. anybody would like to let us know if you are a Gothic fan, Gothic literature fan, please let us know, put us out of our misery and uh, yeah, tell us if you can describe the boundaries, I guess, of what the genre is and look lots of the genres are artificial and people write across boundaries all the time the story tells the story and that's what it is and we try carefully to stick it into its own little box but uh yeah anyway yeah. there you go and i'm going to try not to scare myself when i go out to the bush next because uh, <laughs> it is very isolated out there and when you spend a couple of days on your own and uh, you realize how vulnerable you are i can only imagine what it must have been like when there wasn't knowledge that you know half hour down the road there's there's civilization <laughs> so to speak <laughs> yes. so yeah. that by day you've got by day there might have been things in the bush to wanting to kill you there was still trying to establish yourself amongst your peers and then by night who knows what's out there as well you just don't know so yeah it must have been a very anxious time and so what, what a what a sort of setting to have that 
have our version of Gothic come out. Lots of sun, lots of flies. But nonetheless, as you mentioned, we've got a huge interview, which is about to take place, with author Phil Hoare. So what, let's what, go. Can, we, what can you say, Veronica? There, let's just, let's again, go. <laughs> strap yourself in and we will see you on the other side. <laughs> and so please enjoy this absolutely spectacular interview, none other than Phil Hoare. Phil Hoare, it is an absolute honour to have you on the Australian Book Lovers podcast. How are you? I'm well. I, I, I like ha thinking of it as an honour. That, 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 that does great things to my ego. Well, that's what, that's what part of our job is, is to, uh, well, not, not to feather the ego, but uh, we want to turn all of our authors that have submitted their works on the website into rock stars, or as I like to say, author stars. So in which case, <laughs> it is an honour to have you on. But I say that also with a, you know, a little bit of gravity as well, because um, before we get down to the nuts and bolts of interview, I guess I should let some of our listeners out there know a little bit about you uh, and from the research I've done in our discussions. And I may just have to drop the mic and walk away exhausted by the time I finish this because it's incredible. <laughs> but I'll run through a, a few uh, aspects of your life for our listeners and then we'll get to it. So I understand you have worked as Australia's National Dinosaur Museum. You're an educator at the Australian War Memorial. You've worked at Questacon Science Centre. You've been, and I'll use this as the quote from your one of your websites, haunting the halls, end quote, in the <laughs> specimen rooms of London's Natural History Museum, as well as the Smith so sorry, the Smithsonian's, always a tricky one for me, National Natural History Museum. Now you've also been published in newspapers and magazines around the world. And I understand that since 2007, you've been the paleo author for the world's longest running dinosaur magazine titled The Prehistoric Times, which uh, is a pretty adequate name, I think, for that. Uh, now, I also understand you've been a comic shop manager, a cinema projectionist, a theatre technician, and as a side note, you've also got a chicken for a deli. Yeah, for one day. It was the shortest job I've ever had. Oh, well, there you go. I got hired and fired on the same day. <laughs> Still, it's on the resume, and that's a that's an important thing. Now, look, considering all of those uh, di different facets of your career and, and, and what is obviously your passion, I guess my first question is, how does it feel to be living the dream? Uh, it's absolutely amazing, and it really is. Like, um, I always tell people, I don't know if you remember back when you were at high school, in year eight, just before you start to choose your electives, you know, you start working out your path to your future university courses or whatever. Uh, they sit you down and go, you know, what do you want to be? And write down all the jobs you want to be so that they can say, well, you'll need science for that one or you'll need, you know, biology or whatever. Um, so the list I wrote down, I've done every single job I wrote down. Oh, really? Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, that is unreal. And I, I always look at things or life as sometimes, what am I doing today that if I go back in time to, well, maybe a little bit beyond, say, you know, the year eight or like, so to, to the little me, you know, 10, 11, when, when all those dreams, when anything is possible, would my, yep. li would my little me, if he came in the room, be happy? And I think there, you know, there are certain times in my life that I'm sure he was or is. So I'm sure that with all of those, um, amazing skills and experiences i have no doubt the uh the tiny little phil is having wearing one huge grin right now and uh the, the fact that you have chased those dreams and brought them to life so i congratulate you that's that's an amazing achievement thank you um i might just also add i think that's old <laughs> so since then i've also worked at the chicago field museum with sue the t-rex the world's biggest t-rex oh do you please do expand i, I <laughs> I was um, caught up with so many different things about you. It's like, no, no, wow. no. I, I was listening to it myself going, oh, yeah, I did that, didn't I? <laughs> um, I also worked at the National Film and Sound Archives, and currently I'm at the Capricorn Caves in Queensland and at the National Botanical Gardens. I'm still helping them out. They've got a big uh, megafauna display about to come in that I've been helping them out uh, uh, design. So you'll be walking around the gardens looking at giant prehistoric marsupials that used to live in Australia. Oh, wow. I was about to ask how does uh, you know, botany fair into this into this uh, museum but of course if it comes to a display of uh, ancient landscapes or environments that yeah wow that's and, and also a lot of, a lot of uh, australian plants evolved needing 
these giant marsupials and things that were feeding off them or defending themselves against these giant marsupial uh, herbivores. And that's why we see a lot of features in the plants today that have no sense. Why, like, why does this plant do this? And it's because the thing, the reason why has now gone, like the, the, the giant, you know, rhino sized wombat has gone extinct. So they don't have to defend themselves from that anymore. Let's take that giant wombat for, as an example, because I love wombats. But uh, can, can you maybe uh, illuminate a little bit of how, in what way might one of the ancient plants protected themselves? Would it have been like so? The so the, rare, the rarest tree in Australia is in central Australia, like uh, around the, the, the borders of you know, Northern Territory, South Australia. Uh, it's called the Willy Willy tree, I do believe. Um, and it's quite bizarre. It's got an incredibly straight stem for about, you know, three, four meters. And then it's got this huge array of spikes. And then basically what you think of the tree, the leaves, the, the branches are above that. And so it's got this bizarre defense mechanism about two meters off the ground. And there's no reason for that. Wow. That makes but, me think of, because you, you mentioned you're in Queensland and I, I remember working in through the, the hinterlands there through like all, all the sort of rainforests and stuff. And there was what the guys on set would call the wait a while. And if you accidentally stepped into it, it was essentially like nature's like hardcore barbed wire. And yep. you'd have to, you, if you, every move you made would entangle you further and start cutting into you. And, and so you'd have to just wait, like, hence the name wait a while. You'd have to stand still and wait for someone to come and, you know, kind of pry you out, you, cut you away. Yeah. So I wonder if that's any relation to the willy willy. I don't know. I'm trying to make, picture it in my head, but, uh, well, there's a lots of plants. There's a, a tree that um, suddenly started killing cows and they didn't know why. And it's a, basically a defensive mechanism from, for that sized browser to not eat that tree. And because cows didn't evolve around that tree, they don't know not to eat it. Uh -huh. But I'm pretty sure if there was a giant wombat around, you know, it'd go, you know, previous generations of wombats have taught us don't eat that tree. <laughs> Well, maybe that's why they decided to go underground. Everything above ground was trying to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the big ones, of course. Modern adaptations of animals to past environments is amazing when that environment doesn't exist any longer. Yeah, but, but not only that, what I always to this day find absolutely incredible is, you know, when, when we talk about nature's defence mechanisms, or in this case plants or, or trees or fauna's defence mechanism, I still cannot conceptually wrap my head around the idea that the plant can gather knowledge with regards to its uh for want of a better word predators so you know for example if i go and pull the leaf off that leaf is ripped off what information is then given to the plant well the plant knows its leaf is missing and how does it develop over time and i know obviously long lengths of time allow quite wondrous things to take place but at what point do they realize a particular animal is doing that plucking and therefore you know because it can be so complicated out there in nature that you know a plant may develop a particular needle that has a particular toxin on it that affects only those animals that one time chose to feast on it 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 it, it all comes down to that magic word variation so in every species in every group like in all humanity we none of us are the same we've all got slight variations and if you take that to generations, think of every human that's ever lived, every homo sapien that's ever lived, how many microscopic, you know, minute differences are there between all of us? And so when, you, when you're when you looking at a range of billions and something new enters like, say, a toxin, 99.9% um, .9 of the people will fall for that toxin. But that 0.1%, for some reason in their DNA, because everything's slight variations, they might have something in their DNA that resists that toxin. Mm -hmm. And so everybody else died and you're the only one having kids. And now your kids have that resistance to that toxin. So that's oh. a kind of reverse way of talking about. I was going to say, yeah, that's the reverse. Yeah. So, uh, so the other way is like every single tree might have slight different variations of that toxin or none at all. And it's just one of those trees, the variation of toxin it managed to produce is slightly different to all the others is the effective one. And so all the other trees got eaten. And so genetically they're not in the gene pool anymore. And that one tree that managed to develop that one slight variation of toxin is the one that's seeding. Yeah, no, that makes sense. In, in that case, at some point in the genetic structure 
or the genetic uh, reproduction capabilities of a plant, it has already inbuilt into the information held within its genetics the ability to make toxins and then obviously different toxins. But why would it need toxins to, that can affect bio, like a you know, biological animal as opposed to a plant? Uh, I kind of, do you know what I mean? Like, my, point is, my point is that they do, like they do everything. Like most, most tree species over a huge amount of time would probably, some of them would have tried thorns. Some of them would have tried, you know, like, and we're, we're making it sound like they're making decisions. <laughs> well, like in, 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 their, in their genetics, there is a slight variation and that slight variation produces a slightly more bitter taste or a slightly more toxic seed or a slight, like every single tiny little variation will eventually lead to something that works. Yes, yes. And but if it doesn't, they're gone. They're gone. So I think that there, there is a decision-making process that I believe, anyway, and that is even at a cellular level, maybe even below that, is the decision to survive and, and therefore to do anything it takes and to expand on its, like I said, and all the varieties of, of ev evolving. But there's, there's that deep down desire, decision to survive at all costs. Yeah, you know, maybe decisions the word the wrong word, maybe trigger or something like that. Like there's something that developed very early on that creates the need to not be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's another way of looking at it. Yeah, I don't think any of us want to be eaten. Absolutely. But the, I guess these are this is how far she can be sidetracked when we're we're, yeah. we're here to talk about books when you've got such well, a, welcome to amazing, my world <laughs> yeah such an amazing uh, background there so well look we'll, we'll get back on track and let's 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 start perhaps at the beginning and we'll, and perhaps we'll talk first about the book that you were so generous to list on the australian book lovers website and that is the order of the dragon but i also understand it's titled the brotherhood of the dragon is it under two titles or is it just the one? It, 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 it's, it's officially only under the one. The problem was um, I originally had it produced by a, uh, an American um, publisher and the, almost the day the book was released, he dropped dead. Oh, no. And his family are untouchable. I've done everything I can to contact them. I try to go through Amazon to kind of get them to, you know, I did find another publisher for it and they will not, Amazon just won't touch it. They won't take off the name. They won't remove it. They still sell that original book. And I have no idea where those royalties are going. Really? Um, so, yeah. So my new publisher and I, we decided, well, let's just rebrand the book and try and step away from that older version. Yeah. This is one of the new, one of the weird things that you, you discover in this new world of like uh, Amazon and online publishing and, and uh, you know, uh, international sales and things is yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of landmines out there you're not quite aware of yeah yeah well i, I don't know if you feel comfortable or, or you're open to chatting about how you was it something that you put into place while you were in in america working or was it uh, something that you collaborated for you know while in another country or uh it was actually um i had a in, in fact the book that just got released this week i've had for a while with a couple of different publishers and um, this is where it gets really strange. It's, it's, it's actually based on an event in the comic book history back in the 1950s when the um, international governments all turned on comic books. Like every generation, the media is blamed for the kids. So Rotting you know, the brain. Yeah, or just their behaviour. You know, so mm -hmm. um, that damn rap music, that damn heavy metals making them all commit suicide. Every generation, they, the, the government more finds a scapegoat to blame the behaviour on the kids on. Um, and in the fifties, it was comic books and very specifically horror comics. And, uh, yeah, there was a Senate uh, hearing into it in the U S which then spread into Australia. Um, the Australian government reacted quite heavily against, uh, a lot of these comics, England, uh, France, Italy, all these Western nations in the fifties really turned on comics in a big way. And it became this big kind of, uh, uh, scare. So anyways, yeah. So I've had th this book about that. And I was shipping it around and uh, finally I found a publisher who went, oh, I'm not really interested in that book. Do you have anything else? Uh -huh. So I, I've got about, you know, 10 or 12 books in various degrees of completeness. And at the end of it, I just threw in one that I went, well, this is, I've got this idea for this book. <laughs> and he went, that's the one I want. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. So uh, uh, luckily, um, you know, I had most of the idea set out. I just had to sit down and write it. So it only took, you know, a couple of months to punch it out. And yeah, so I got it out, got it published, and then he dropped it. That's, uh, yeah, that's unfortunate to say the least. Yeah. And so I might guess is without going into too many legal stuff, but I'm assuming that the publishing company or the person involved has put it under their business name or whatnot. And, and of yeah, course, so it's never easy for someone to come and go, oh, I, I, want, I need to take that business off. Um, Which is Amazon's point. Yeah. Like, you know, um, such his... A, such his, a difficult uh, situation. Yeah. To the point that it, it just turned out to be easy to step away. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Lord knows how many sales I've lost over the years, a couple of years for that. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is what happens. Well, it's, a, it's another unique tale to add to a, a, a very unique background. But the good news is the book is available still for all of our yeah. Australian book lovers out there. Absolutely. And so we're going to go with The Order of the Dragon. and the Or oh, Brotherhood, Brotherhood of the Dragon. That's the one. Oh, the Order of the Dragon's the old one. <laughs> oh, okay. Order then of the I... Dragon's the old one. Brotherhood of the Dragon's the new one. <laughs> okay. So The Brotherhood of the Dragon has a synopsis that reads, 1881, London. A series of murders around Whitechapel have two very old friends investigating the deaths. Soon they're joined by Arthur Con Doyle, Con Conan Doyle sorry, and Bram Stoker, and all end up fighting for their survival as an ancient horror rises and threatens to destroy the world. Book one in a brand new series. So can you tell me what inspired the book and what have we got? Because I, I, I have read a little bit about what's coming in with regards to book two, but we, we maybe just I'd love to hear your thoughts on book one. I did well, see that. It, sorry, it, I did see that uh, the brief little bit of reading I was able to do, at least the part that I read, was in the first person narrative. It is. It so, is. Um, you actually read uh, what triggered it. So, I discovered this interesting fact that Bram Stoker and Arthur Conan Doyle were cousins. Oh, I didn't know that either. No, most people don't. And they were real life cousins, and they were both in London around that area at the time of the Jack the Ripper murders. So mm -hmm. the greatest horror and the greatest detective writer on the planet were both in near Whitechapel during the Ripper murders, and nobody's ever used that. <laughs> well, unless they're still under inve secret investigation. Well, that's that's very <laughs> true. Uh, so yeah, so it was just, and um, as you've probably noticed by my bio, uh, I have a somewhat of a history working in history. Yes. So I just started to to pull threads. And that's what I always tell people is I, I pull threads. And the weird thing is being a comic book fan from a very young age gives you a very strange brain because you have to remember storylines and you have to remember characters and you have to remember introductions. You have to remember back 13 years ago in issue 311, this event happened, which then comes back many years later in the storyline to affect the current storyline. That's and an interesting point. Yeah, and so that works in history as well. So I've actually written a two million word book on Australian history, which nobody will ever publish. Whoa, we yeah. might have to revisit that little statement a bit later in the podcast. Yeah, but literally because I kept pulling threads about a fossil. There was a fossil discovered in Australia and I kept pulling threads on this fossil and suddenly found Napoleon and I found Charles Darwin. And I like it just unthreaded this amazing history that nobody's ever talked about. Like Australia was literally discovered because of the fall of the Roman empire. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And it's because I remember, you know, they'd, they'd mention the name in somewhere. I'd go, is that the same guy as I read in this other story about this other event? And it would turn out it was. Um, so the same with this, I, I just started pulling threads and started to uncover this kind of storyline behind the Jack the Ripper murders. That I went well. That's that's the story. I've got to I've got to play with that. As you would have to, yeah. And and when it came, obviously you've spent some time in London, did you utilise the ability to walk the streets and and maybe wait till the the cold dead of night to to give yourself a little bit of inspiration? Or was a it absolutely yeah? But oh, also, fantastic. um, if you've ever, if you ever go to London, one of the things I suggest you do is the uh, Jack the Ripper walks. They'll actually have a bunch of Jack the Ripper authors. Okay. take you through the streets and walk you through the streets and literally place you in the places that all these events happen. And that was an amazing experience just to sit there and watch and listen to, that, to another well, author, you know, tell their side of the story. Yeah. So, and I'm guessing is it like a lot of the walks now, are they like app orientated where you can do at your own pace and 
certain spots trigger, you know. Re- I'm, uh, I'm sure that you phones. can, I'm almost positive you can do that. It's been a while since I've been to London and, you know, the, the rise of the apps over the last couple of years is phenomenal. Mm. So I, I, I just can't imagine that doesn't happen, but I can't imagine these walks aren't still happening because there's also a personality that comes with a live performance and it is a kind of live performance. Yeah, I think the- theatre is always going to trump some, you know, it, if you're somewhere different, theatre is always going to give a lot more excitement to the, uh, the moment for sure. Yeah, um, and, to, and to literally walk. And a, lo- a lot of things don't, like, you have to interpret what you're reading a lot of the times. So you might get to a street corner and it says, if you look here, you might see this thing. And you're like, well, where's that thing? I can't see it. Whereas if you've got a guy who literally, or a woman, you know, a, a, a tour guide who literally knows what they're talking about and can answer your question when you have it, that's always going to be a better experience than an app. Yeah, most definitely. Well, I'm I'm uh, very happy to hear you got the chance to spook yourself a little bit and get 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 down and dirty on the cobblestones. Uh, yeah. I I do know that very briefly when we when I, when we when I was working in the film industry and uh, and it was actually oddly enough it was uh, on an American TV show called The Lost World, which was as you know by Sir Arthur Conan oh. Doyle. That was yeah. a great series. Yeah, so I don't know if you remember, there was a Jack the Ripper or English uh, episode uh, set in the old old Jack the Ripper London. And, you know, it was amazing because the set was built out in the subtropics of the hinterlands. <laughs> and and obviously from behind, it's just planks of wood. But the, the detail they put in the set was incredible. And then so by the time the lights, you know, the night went down and the lights came on and, you know, the blue lights and the cobblestones were hosed down and all the authentic shop fronts. It was uh, it was amazing. It was like you were standing in a completely different time in a completely different city. You know, meanwhile, there's 200 meters away. There's a cow, you know, rubbing its head against the fence. <laughs> so kangaroo hey, hopping around in the background. <laughs> yeah. So that's the uh, the the wonders of uh, productions, I suppose, and, and the mag- magic of movies. But the reason why I originally brought up uh, that it was written in the first person, it's it's something that I've dabbled a little bit with. By myself as an author and i do find it fascinating but i'm wondering when it comes to at least the brotherhood of the dragon and the first person narrative do you find that with with regards to the other characters do, do they remain somewhat of a mystery as far as uh you do you make a conscious effort not to develop them too much because in essence you're using your main character as a vessel of discovery or because you did mention with your comic book history you, you've pretty much got your through line established right back to at any point. Um, so I guess, do you, do you flesh out your, your other characters as much as you already have probably an idea of your own main character, or do you let them organically sort of reveal themselves as part of the story, as part of your discovery, being that, that you're the narrator? Well, there's probably three answers to that question. <laughs> Straight off the top, I just want to ask you, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, yeah, no, yeah, no, no, wait, hang on, that's something else. <laughs> so, so one thing I would say is um, I do get asked because, you know, I, I write so much stuff for so many things. People kind of go, well, you know, I want to write a book. How do you write a book? I'm like, you write it. And my biggest advice is get to the end. Mm-hmm. Don't stop. Don't, if you've got a thing that you don't need to write, don't write it. So if there's a battle, all you need to know who wins that battle, come back and write that battle at another time. Unless there's something important, just make some notes about what you need the result to be. Get to the end of the book, because I guarantee you when you get to the end of the book, your beginning is going to have to be rewritten because your story will develop over time. Your characters will introduce themselves to you. Like events will take over. Like I kept trying to put this event in the first book. And it just wouldn't fit. Like every time I tried, the storyline would go a different way. So my point is get to the end because if you just spend all your time rewriting that first chapter, you might have the greatest first chapter ever written, but that's not going to be your first chapter by the time you get to the end of the book because things are going to develop and change. So that's one thing. The other thing was um, I I really wanted to base the books on the universal monsters. I love Uh the universal monsters and each book being a different universal monster. Right. So... In the background, it was, I, 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 so the first one, I'm not sure if I want to say who's the main protagonist. No, 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 by all means don't say. But, there but is yeah, a main so, protagonist. But yeah, so let, let's just say one book's about vampires, one book's about, uh, you know, Frankenstein, one book's about the mummy. Um, so I looked into the history of all of that and found anything that would connect to my characters and also the storyline. 
was there any event that happened at that time that was in like one of the, the universal monster movies or books. So, yeah, so it was, um, but to the third part, which is your main part of the question is using a first person's perspective is exactly what you just said. It gets to have your main character reveal in like, there's nothing more tedious than exposition. Like if you have 10 pages of this is how they got to this point. Mm -hmm. I find that to be quite boring. Like, yeah, but that's not why I'm reading the book. I want to get to the good bit. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. Like, hurry up. Whereas if you've got a character who can either, either internally monologue some information to you or ask the question that you're hoping your audience is asking or wanting to be answered, then that just cuts away a lot of that because it, a, it makes it a lot more immediate and creates it more into a dialogue rather than just a block of information. Yeah, I was about to say it's it's more like you the the character is talking to the reader as a, a reader as opposed to the prose is explaining to the reader. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just realised there's a fourth part to the answer. <laughs> By all means, sir. which is I wanted my character to be hard boiled. I, I love. I was going to say Humphrey Bogart's The Big Sleep, and I do love that movie, but I also love the book, the Raymond Chandler story, The Big Sleep. And I read a book years ago by an author who's probably the most influential author for me a guy called Glenn Cook and Glenn Cook has a massive fantasy series. If you like fantasy, you have to read the black company. Oh, okay. The black company is a, just this dynamic, you know, 12 book series about this mercenary company who basically takes on the world. It's just amazing. But he has a secondary series called uh, the Garrett PI series, which is a hard boiled detective, you know, basically a Humphrey Bogart character in a fantasy world. Okay, that, that sounds pretty cool. I mean, because who doesn't love a, a hardball detective story noir? So, so when, you go to the, to, when you go to the bar and the bounce is as big as a gorilla or an ogre, it actually is an ogre. But one of the books, I was reading it and I just kept going, I know this story. And about halfway through the book, uh, uh, something happens and I went, oh my God, it's The Big Sleep. He's rewritten The Big Sleep. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, it's called um, Old Tin Sorrows. And it's literally a fantasy version of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. Well, why, why not uh, expand on something that's already done masterfully? Yeah. And so that's when I made the decision, right, I'm going to make a horror version of The Big Sleep based around the Jack the Ripper murders. Yeah, that's a, fantastic, that's a stupendously good idea, I think. And that's why it's in a first-person perspective, because it's a hardball detective story. And, it's, you know, and, and there are, there, there are scene-for-scenes parts of the big sleep in the book that because i remember that triggered scene i went well i want that scene in there too well that's the, so, uh, to, author, the, the author's license isn't it you can put any scene you want in there yeah so but but more for the people in the know so some hopefully somebody will have the same get to have the same experience i had which was that realization that oh my god this is the thing that <laughs> i love this guy must love it too <laughs> So, you, so what you're saying is uh, there's the literary equivalent of Easter eggs to be found in your tale. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So like thing. throughout the whole book, like there are so many little secret things. And in fact, it's to the point that when you get to the end of the book, there's actually a glossary at the end that will give away most of the things that you, you either saw to, to reinforce that, yes, you did see it, or that you go back and go, what? I didn't see that. And you go back and go, oh, my God, it's it was there all right along. Yeah. So uh, like there's so much real history. Um, I kind of, the way I describe it is um, if you know the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. No, I can't say I'm familiar. So they're the two characters. They're the two best friends of Hamlet. Oh, okay. And so when you watch Hamlet, they keep introducing Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, his two friends who are brought to bring him mirth to get him out of his funk. And oh, I've just forgotten the playwright. But anyway, uh, he realized their story could be interesting. So he wrote a play in the background of Hamlet. So it's these two characters just talking to each other about life and they keep stepping into Hamlet, doing their scenes mm -hmm. and then stepping back out of Hamlet and moving to the next scene. And in that next scene, they'll be talking about something else. And so that's the way I, I write my books is I want it to be the absolute real history. Like everything that really happens in these books pretty much happened, except this is my character's take on that real history. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. how they saw it happen. Okay, it's interesting because it's kind of like doing a 180 degree, you know, camera move or something, and then we delve into the 
life or story of, say, one of the background actors who actually yeah. it turns out they play a pivotal role in, in the story that, you know, everybody knows, but nobody knows the story, the role that these people played in the story that everybody knows. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I think by the sounds of it, that's a little bit, it, it can link back to how you described your method of approaching things, and that is pulling the threads. Because one little thread may be that whole new avenue of, of story and adventure that, that it binds to the same, you know, tapestry, I suppose. So, yeah, very, very unique, very awesome way to look at things and to approach things. And it, it, like, and it also goes into my background. So I always, like, one of the interesting things I discovered was that during the Crimea War, uh, the Charge of the Light Horse, this famous battle, the Light Horse, the actual horses they were riding were whalers. They were all supplies by Australia, supplied by Australia. Ah. Because when you look at the world back then, Australia was basically directly underneath the Crimea in certain ways. And so it was much easier for us to supply horses to the British Army while they're fighting the Russians than anywhere else. Because most of the other countries were actually in the war. They were using their horses themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so most of the horses were from... And then I realised this connection. And so, um, for example, Dracula, if you look into Dracula, like how does he get from one place to the other? And it's all happening around the time, like the, the, the basis of Dracula is kind of happening around the same time as the Crimean War. So you actually have all this, this warfare happening around Transylvania at the time. So well, you've got to attach that somehow. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Do you think Dracula was a, a, a symbol of, you know, cause it, and I'm going very abstract here, and, and I'm not a very good historian on Dracula or, but I do, you know, I love the tale and the concept. Yeah, but yeah. Is, is he um, like a symbol of all that is evil in terms of, you know, bloodthirst and war and stuff, but at the same time represent that, that seductive nature that evil can become? Because without evil being seductive, there, there wouldn't be such widespread evil. Well, weirdly, it depends. Like if you're looking at Dracula today, then I would say it is the seductive side of things because of the way... Dracula has been used over the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. But if you go back in time, the story kind of changes. And that's where I've found a lot of my history that I write on is in the past, there weren't that many books. And so if there was a historical event, some person wrote a book about it. And because there weren't any other books or points of view on that event, that becomes the history of what happened. It becomes the law. Yes. But if you can get past that, that, that book, go past it into other older resources like newspapers or whatever, often the story completely changes. And so that's kind of the story with Dracula. Like Vlad was a real person. He was put in charge of stopping the Ottoman Empire from invading Euro Christian Europe by the Pope. He was put in charge of an official um, Pope knight order, the, or the Brotherhood of the Dragon, which uh -huh. is the symbol. Yeah, so that's where that comes from. So he actually had a a group of knights with him and he became so effective that he did stop it. But it was in such a way that the Pope actually kind of had to disavow him and go, yeah, thanks for doing that. But Jesus, did you have to do it that way? <laughs> Who would have thought a Pope unleashing a monster onto the world? Yeah. That just doesn't and, make any sense. And it's not like he didn't have a choice. Like this guy was, you know, in, didn't have a huge army to back him and had the entire Ottoman empire coming down on him. So he had to do some pretty drastic things. Yeah. Comes back to our discussion of the, is it a decision or is it a necessity to survive? Yeah. Do whatever you can to survive. Absolutely. Also knowing that it's not just you that's surviving. It's the entire Christian kingdom of France and Germany and, oh, not Germany, but, you know, um, Prussia. And mm -hmm. all these things are kind of relying on you. <laughs> Yeah, not to put too much responsibility on one person's shoulders, but yeah, yeah. a lot, <laughs> definitely. The, all the universal monsters have carried through with, uh, they, they just don't get old, do they, as far as the, there's, they're timeless. Also and, because they can be reinterpreted. I think that's the big Like, like Dracula, yeah. Yeah, the one that doesn't is the one that has remained true and really has never been used again, which is the um, creature from the Black Lagoon. It's almost that original film. Like, yes, they did make a couple of films after it and they get worse as you go. But that original film is held in such a place and that image of that, that creature that even today, you, like I'm sure there's been talk in Hollywood of redoing it. 
but it never really gets done. I guess you could say the shape of water and things like that are close. Close, yeah. I mean, maybe this is something you can look at uh, sharpening your pencil against because I, I would think that, you know, with Creature from Bat Lagoon, it's unlike, say, for example, and not Universe, but something like Godzilla or, or Dracula or Frankenstein, you can put them in different scenarios. But the Creature from the Black Lagoon, isn't that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it ultimately a sort of a love lost, a love story? The yeah. original story, yeah. Mm. But it's also like, I actually wrote a P oh, one of my, the, the greatest things I ever got to do was um, I got to write, write for famous monsters of Filmland, like uh, that magazine that you see in every Hollywood film about horror. They're always reading this famous monsters magazine that has been around. It's probably the oldest running magazine at the time. And it's, unfortunately it's just gone under recently. Um, yeah. But I got to actually write yeah. for, for famous monsters about the paleontology of horror wow okay can you explain a little bit of what that concept is the paleontology of horror you've got so there's a lot of horrors out there that are dealing with creatures from the past mm -hmm. so a classic is godzilla and depending on which version of godzilla you're talking about it but originally he is a dinosaur and uh there's other creatures of similar ancient 50s and 60s ancient i shouldn't say ancient um horror movies and, and sci-fi movies that are based on Oh, this frozen creature has got out of the ice thanks yes. to this atomic bomb. And so it's a dinosaur or whatever. So there's a, quite a few films about that. And creature is probably the greatest of all of them. It's a Devonian creature. Um, they're actually look, the, the movie starts with paleontologists digging out a fossil hand in the coral reef that is right where the creature still lives. And so they're talking about, oh, imagine if this, this looks like this ancient Devonian creature, like a coelacanth fish, um, has adapted to a more humanoid, humanoid form. Oh, isn't it lucky they're not around anymore? Yeah, so there's some serious uh, paleontology you know, in, in uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. So I get the feeling that there is a story there to be retold, and I'm hoping to maybe one day do it. Excellent. Um, but coming at it from that side of things, not the... Not the horror side of it, but the science side of it. The genetic possibilities and how they might exist or... Yeah, and, and other loca like, um, especially in this world where we now know about extremophiles, where yeah. creatures survive in places they have no right to survive in. Like volcanic vents under the sea. Yeah, so maybe there are places where some of these things are still getting around. Am I saying too much? Has somebody just stolen my idea? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the search for life out in space, really, that's what the extremophiles, that we need to understand them more, don't we? Uh, that's going to give us a better idea of if we're looking for life on other planets, then, you know, what sort of cellular structures can we expect to find? I think it's a fascinating uh, aspect of science. And literally this morning, I, I, I've got a little piece that I'm writing at the moment about sea monkeys. Ah. Uh -huh. The ones that I always wanted to order from the back of the comic books, but I never and did get around. Oh, I think maybe that, I did once. Aren't they mosquitoes? That's part of my point of view. Uh, well, they're actually brine shrimp. Oh, so okay. they're basically the things that whales and things eat and, and that show up in like deserts after it rains because they their um, eggs can survive. They, they basically desiccate and they can survive until water hits them and then they'll bloom again. Yes. And that's why they'd, they, they'd just be the dried out eggs. You just throw them in a bit of water and they, they come back to life. But they were actually taken to the moon. Uh, so I think it was Apollo 17, like some of the later Apollo missions actually took them outside the, the, the capsules to see what the, the celestial radiation of space would do to these extremophile eggs. And so when they got back, they tried to breed them again and see what survived and what didn't, what mutations happened and what didn't. And I'm like, oh my God, how many horror movies have started that way? <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, just on a side note, was there any alteration to their ability? Oh yeah. To, so 90% yeah. didn't survive at all. Okay. 10% did breed and of that 10%, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, a uh, 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 hatch. And of that 10%, most of them had pretty severe mutations around their stomachs and things like they, like it did a lot to them. It basically fantastic for them. It, the uh, oh, right. cosmic radiation messed up their DNA pretty bad. Well, a quick shout out to the scientists that did that study. Uh, just wanted to say, I really hope you didn't flush them down the toilet <laughs> because that is how some real horror stories start. Well, that, you know, that's the story I'm telling is like 
all those ads that we saw in these papers, all the, all the comics we read when we were kids that, that sold all these bizarre things, um, it's actually an Australian. It's an Australian who started this company that did all of that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, and um, one, of the th- one of the ads I've just discovered from about the 50s or um, maybe the 60s and 70s was in the mail. <laughs> he was sending pets, snakes and lizards and turtles and all these creatures like monkeys. You could buy a monkey and they'd send it to you in the mail. So just so, just so I can be clear in my head. So you're saying that the, that whole concept of all the, the wacky and wonderful things you could snip out and send for them back at comics, that was yep. actually originated from an Australian. Yeah. A guy lived in, uh, in uh, Queensland and then moved to Sydney and then headed over to Chicago and started the, uh, the Johnson Smith company, which is, if you look at all of those ads at the bottom, it says Johnson Smith. So yes, his name was Johnson Smith. Wow. And, yeah, this Australian guy is behind it all. That's uh, that, that is unreal. That's great. Yeah, isn't it? And, and the way I came into that is um, uh, somebody was sh- talking about the cover of uh, Action Comics number one, the very first Superman comic, worth a million dollars. And they actually showed the full cover. So not just the front cover, but the, the attached back cover as well. And the back cover is one of those ads. And I was just like, oh, I wonder what those they're selling. And I was looking at it, and, you know, it's all the usual stuff, X-ray specs and all those things. Yes, of course. And then there, there was the, t- the tagline at the bottom. I went, well, wouldn't that company be a mate? You know, we never hear about that company saying, hey, we were on Action Comics number one. <laughs> and I looked into it and went, oh, my God, it's an Australian. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is absolutely fascinating, I think. So, yeah, this Australian connection to the most expensive comic in the world. Well, not only that, to, to huge, you know, uh, art, you know, art form, the comic books in general. I mean, that, it's kind of, it goes in hand in hand with comics, doesn't it? That whole on the back of the... And, like it, it, it and, and one of the points I'm making is us in Australia, it's an alien world. We knew that they'd never get here. We couldn't order them, you know, or they just wouldn't accept international money orders or whatever. So there's this whole world that we're looking like outsiders in looking at all these uh, fantastic ads and things like that going, well, you know, we could never get those, you know, like that's not something for us. It's for those lucky kids in America. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe this gentleman's got some explaining to do. Why didn't he have an uh, uh, yeah, Australian branch for his company for the Australian edition comics? Well, it looks like his company went on, but it changed into a couple of different things. Um, so there's another you know side to that story too. Yeah. But um, my point being is that when I discovered this pet ad, and like I've spent time in America, like in, in America at the moment, like Florida is overrun with Burmese pythons. Oh, crikey. And, um, you know, like, uh, New York, oh, the alligators in the sewers. And all these places, there's places like Queensland where we've got cane toads. We know how they got here. But there's all these exotic pets that have been released into the wild and grown to now dominate these wild landscapes and actually become serious problems. All from comics. Is it this guy's fault? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that's given me a whole new uh, love of the movie Alligator. Yeah. Um, <laughs> see what I mean? Like, and this yeah. is, welcome to my world. This is how my brain works. <laughs> so this, this is definitely how you pull a thread and... So then there's an Australian that organizes comic books that ends up uh, sending lizards to the wrong cities in America who then get turfed. And yeah, that it's an and, ama- and, amazing and train I, of thought. If I wasn't aware of the natural history side of my history, like working in museums of like problem animals and things like that, that leap would never have been made. <laughs> the, yeah, absolutely. And possibly due to you, you, you've great research skills as well. Yeah. Uh, in fact, speaking, that's, go oh, sorry, I was just going to say um, like Peter Fitzsimons, the, uh, rugby union star who writes all the Australian history books at the moment. Oh, I'm a South Australian, so I don't know much about rugby and well, uh, I'm not aware of his history well, books, I'm afraid. If, if you watch a lot of uh, chat shows and, and things, there's always a guy in a red bandana, this old Australian guy with a beard with a red bandana. He's always wearing a red bandana. Oh, and, actually, uh, I think I might know who you mean now. Yeah, that's, that's why, like, like his, his recent book, he, he, he does, he's Australia's number one author, has been for years. Um, uh, and he, he wrote about the Batavia, the, the shipwreck of the Dutch. Um, but his recent book is The Ball War. And it literally says at the front, you know, I'd like to thank Phil Hall <laughs> because I didn't want to write this book. I had no interest in the Ball War. And because I worked at the War Memorial, I was talking to him one day and I went, well, hang on one sec. <laughs> and I started uh-huh. telling him all these stories. And he's like, well, that can't be true. 
Well, there you go. And you've just uh, created a whole new job to add to your ever-expanding resume, and that is uh, creating magic in what people may not realise is there when it comes well, to I, the I stories do. and history. So I do research for other people as well because, like, I, research is my forte. Like, I get into places that you wouldn't even think to look. So what would be speak, stuff? Yeah, well, speaking of research, and I'd like to try and combine research museum and the potential second book in the Brotherhood of the Dragon series. Um, so, because I understand book two is done, and I understand it's uh, involved researching Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Howard Carter, Alexander Dumas, and Set against a backdrop, of course, of the historical discovery of King Tut's tomb. So I've, I've got a million questions about King Tut's tomb, but Go for it. Uh, but I guess you know, incorporating all that, the, the fact that he did all that research. So what would be first, I guess, is your three top points for anyone looking to do their own research, stepping into uh, some sort of you know deep research. So if they want to get to where you get to, and and really discover these unique threads to pull. If you had to pull, if you had to just put three top points down, what would they be? Well, one would probably be um, research the topic from the time it was a topic, not with current terminology. Okay. So what, what do you a, mean? By a great that? example for that is today we call fossils fossils, but a hundred years ago they weren't called fossils; they were called oolites. Okay. So if you're if you just even go onto Google Books and research fossils, you're not going to go back very far because either fossil means something else, which is basically fossicking, looking for gold, looking for anything, but you're not going to find the, 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 the nuggets of unknown information that you're looking for because that's not a term they used. Yeah, that's they really said interesting. They oolite. So if you look up, if you Google oolite, suddenly you get all these hits from all these 300 years worth of books about people discovering oolites in weird places and you, you start to unravel, unravel like an older history of the science that we know as paleontology. Wow. But, if, but for example, is that a term that's still used today in a, from, in a scientific nope. literature? No, I, I, like I doubt many people, except for the people who research paleontology <laughs> or are professors of the science, would even know the name Oolite. There you go. But, you know, that, that's just an example. So, yes, yes. Um, you know, like if you're researching, um, one of the things I like to talk about is the 1781 transit of Venus. And that's when Venus cross, a uh, transit is when a planet crosses the sun and you can see it. And so in seven, and the Venus one is quite bizarre. You get one and then you get another one eight years later. And then you don't get an, uh, th then the cycle doesn't repeat for another something like 170 years. Wow. So it's good. If and then you get two. Time. Yeah. <laughs> and at that time it was really important because they realized with uh, triangulation, they could measure the transit of Venus and work out the distance of earth from the sun. So um, in 17, uh, sorry, 1761, 1761, they sent teams and this is during the seven years war. So every European nation is at war with every other European nation. But somehow all the scientists in those uh, nations tied together. They went, well, let's ignore the politicians. They're idiots. We have this important one-off event that we can really answer an important question. So let's talk to each other secretly and kind of develop where we're going to send our people across the globe to measure on this date the transit of Venus. Because mm -hmm. we have to send them everywhere because one place might have clouds, one place it might not be as good as somewhere else. Exactly. So we've got to get them all over the place just to make sure we get the measurements. Um, and they did. They sent them, oh, just it's the, the greatest story of disaster in science ever. Okay. Like every single one of them either dies horribly or things happen. Like my, one of my favourite stories is a guy goes, he's sent to Siberia. And Siberia back then is like, you know, it, it, it's it's almost like Siberia today. It's so remote and so backwards and so primitive in its, you know, there's not a lot of technology out there or anything today. Um, Siberia is like Siberia 100 years ago. So it's like basically being in another primitive culture almost. Well, you could almost say it's frozen in time. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> sorry bad pun. Well, no, 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 because that's actually a very good point because that leads to the next point. So this guy showed up, pointed all his um, instruments at the sun, and suddenly Siberia had the greatest thaw it's had in 20 years. Oh, wow. And 
people are dying, there's rivers overflowing, there's mudslides everywhere. And all these yokels look at him and go, so you pointed that thing at the sun <laughs> yeah. and suddenly everything started getting hot. Yeah. Can you feel that X on the back of your neck? Literally. Um, so a lot of these stories, and because there weren't so many books back then, they, you'd kind of, and you, you do a lot of this research, you start to get a nose for it. I kept seeing the same basically phrase. So one of these guys was sent to Mexico and you kind of read the phrase and it goes, got there just as he arrived, yellow fever broke out. All of his team were doctors. They could have walked away, but they, they're doctors. They, they rolled up their sleeves. They helped out the, the local population and they all died. But the last basically gasp of this main guy was he managed to write down his recordings from the transit of Venus in his journal to which then a small boy that had been attached to the, to the expedition was the only survivor and he came back and that's why we know what happened. And that's pretty much exactly what you read in every book. And this goes back for like, you know, 80 years. You can Google mm. books and do it by date. And you can literally see that phrase over and over and over again. And that immediately told me somebody wrote a book 80 years ago, which is the only book on the transit of Venus. And it became the book on transit of Venus. That everyone and else has been referencing. Yeah. And once I got past that date, that book was published, the entire story changes. Like it's, it's not true. It's not true at all. Like, yes, some of them died by yellow fever, but like there's an incredibly famous artist whose paintings are hanging in the Louvre and he was the, 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 the expedition artist and he survived. And it's a totally different story to what that guy wrote. And so, yeah, like, um, so be aware that try and, try and look for patterns. And that's a really big thing in history. If you start seeing patterns, get nervous. Okay, I would have thought the opposite. And, you know, because you're raising some really interesting points. Uh, episode three podcast, we were talking about, you know, nonfiction and also the, you know, the doing research in general and the, the transition that we've seen over time, you know, with, with today's digital media, uh, for example, with YouTube and f photographs and stuff like that. There's, there's not, nothing subjective about a video image or a, of a photo uh, or perhaps, you know, certain documents. But the further you go back in time, obviously you are relying on memory. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, when it's based on memory. And, you know, in, in, as part of the discussion, I was mentioning how that's why I like libraries with their, uh, if I'm, re if I am going to go in the trenches of research, uh, especially usually for science, but then, because I can look at the references in the back. And if I agree, disagree, or feel that something's not quite right with one particular avenue, I can see the references that this author's used and, and I'll go down that rabbit hole that way. Um, yeah. So, but I'm curious, would you say that r real glimpses of what really happened in history, are they there to be found or is it an, a really interpretive skill where, for example, as you're discussing now, where you've got to bypass patterns and, and look for perhaps uh, mis misplaced sources? I mean, how, how accurate do you think one can get when going back in history to the, the times that you're researching? Oh, um, depending how far back you go. So if you're ba basically playing in the 17th and 18th century, you've got a great chance. That's pretty accurate, yeah. Most people were writing stuff down. You know, like if you think on the Endeavour, Cook was writing his journal, Banks was writing his journal, there was five other scientists, there was a bunch of officers and they're all pretty much elite, you know, high-class people. So they're writing letters. So you're getting a lot of sources of the same event from a lot of places. Yes. yes. The problem being those sources get ignored because you're just looking at the Cook Endeavour Voyage uh, Journal, or you're looking at Banks's notes on whatever, and you're not looking at James Magra. And have you ever heard James Magra? No, but so that, so that, that brings up another interesting point, because if one can't be relied on for the story, then we have to take a conglomerate of the whole, with each being possibly inaccurate. Is that, would that be fair? Uh, yes and no. You, you also have to look at the history of the person that is telling you this tale. Ah, good point. And yeah. the other reactions of other people who are knowledgeable, how they deal with that person's resources as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, greatest his, the greatest person in history that I do not trust a single word from. Okay, this is, is going to be good. Please. Yeah, is a guy called Benavosky. 
Right, okay. I'm still and going to need elaboration. Yeah, Benavosky is uh, basically he becomes the king of Madagascar and he starts an American colony, and this is absolutely true, a United States colony backed by Benjamin Franklin in Madagascar. Wow. So that stuff is true because we've got Benjamin Franklin saying that. Uh-huh. And we've got all these other sources saying this is what he did. What he says he did, however, <laughs> is one of the greatest stories ever. He discovered Japan before anybody else. He broke Japan. He got into Korea before anyone else. Oh, okay. He met, he met Cook in, in um, uh, um, Alaska. And we know he did because Cook said he did. But then this entire story of how he gets from Alaska by stealing ships like he was captured by the Russians in a battle because he's Polish. And in one of those wars, he gets captured and he, uh, he escapes and he, and he romances the, the young daughter of the prison uh, guard and, and steals a ship and sails. And like the adventure he goes, he is Baron Munchausen. The uh, incredible things he says he did are just phenomenal. And the thing is, he did some of them. So, <laughs> well, a good lie has to have a sprinkling of truth, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and, uh, basically, it ends up that uh, he he eventually got 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 his American troops uh, 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 goes back to Madagascar, starts his colony again, um, claims himself king. The French, who actually owned Madagascar at the time, got a bit upset that he would just stolen Madagascar from them. They sent an invasion force and they kill him. Oh. So all those things are true. But Benavosky's story is just phenomenal. And when you go back. They actually wrote a play about Benavosky and the very first time that the, like the um, Star Spangled Banner was ever performed was performed before the, the play of Benavosky's life. So it's, it's just weird stuff, man. <laughs> more threads again that, that shouldn't make sense or shouldn't go together, but somehow do. Yeah, and it's all got to do with Australia. Like the, um, a lot of the French and the Spanish who were visiting Australia just around the first fleet time, uh, were dealing with him because that was one of the few outposts of European outposts where you could get resupplied or, or, or um, you know, fresh water or something. And, and like an incredibly important historical person that you cannot trust. Yes. So basically a well-traveled politician. <laughs> yeah, in a way. <laughs> in a way. But yeah, and, and so that led to, like, I discovered a first first fleet. There was actually a fleet of ships sent to Botany Bay before the first fleet. There was, um, after the first fleet, because we all n- now know today that the first fleet arrived at Botany Bay and they had massive hardships. They were all basically starving. And word got back, the very last prison ship of the 11 ships that showed up at Botany Bay actually stayed for about nine months. It didn't go back directly. It hung around just for a while, just in case they needed anything. And it brought word back going, they're dying. They're all dying. The f- crops aren't growing. The seasons are weird. Um, the ants kill you. Um, Basically, this place is horrible. Everything in yeah. Australia wants to kill you. Yeah, I think that's a T-shirt now. Yeah, and so I've written a book about the rescue mission. They actually sent a ship to save the first fleet before the second fleet, and it goes so far south because it goes south to catch the Roaring Forties, the winds to get underneath Tasmania and basically pop up. It's the quickest way to to sail to Botany Bay back then. Went too far south, hit an iceberg, and is basically Australia's Titanic. Oh, wow. And the, 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 the survival story of this ship is phenomenal. Is it up there with the, the like the, the Shackleton's survival story or? Oh, what? easily, easily. Wow. And the reason why nobody knows of it is that guy basically managed to get the entire, and it's a giant warship. It's one of the proper warships, uh, gets it back to South Africa to, and he even doesn't get back to South Africa. He's not going to make it to Cape Town and the ship's basically, the deck is at, at the water level. That's how low it is sitting in the water. <laughs> He's basically on a raft at this point. Yeah. Uh, and he just goes, well, there's land, shipwreck it. And they just try and get as much speed as they can and they just run it onto the beach. And then they walk <laughs> across wild Africa <laughs> to oh, Cape dear. Town. And so that story itself is fantastic. But the reason why nobody's ever heard of it is they literally get to Cape Town just as Bly from the Mutiny on the Bountney arrives. And Bly's just done pretty much the same thing. He's taken his little boat. He gets kicked off the Bounty. 
um, does one of the greatest single voyages of any seaman ever. Like I think it's like 2000 kilometers in a rowboat. Oh, to that get is all the guys. Yeah. Like it's a serious effort of seamanship. This story is amazing and it's the mutiny on the bounty. So nobody gives a crap about the other ship. They're all talking mutiny on the bounty and that becomes the story that's known and everyone's completely forgotten about this other amazing voyage. And th that's what I'm saying. I kept finding all these things going, that can't be true. And it's absolutely true. Like there's a mutiny on the endeavor. Nobody has ever talked about a mutiny on the endeavor. And there's uh, a mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one thing for sure. You definitely have a, a very special way of bringing to life the, the, the endless possibilities of jewels and diamonds to be found in like hidden jewels and diamonds we found in right, you know, just under the, the little sheets and, in history. And, and I think that's going back to your points, you know, a couple of points. So my second point would be use your experience and trust, kind of trust yourself to look for this stuff and don't doubt it. When you see it, investigate it. If you read something that you're like, well, oh, that didn't happen. I know that didn't happen. Well, it's not necessarily true. So take, take words, take, key phrases take key people out of that event and look into their history people that seem quite minor or just might be mentioned once because that person might have written a journal that person might have their own history and through their history you start to uncover this their tale of that event which might lead you somewhere else wow and i was just thinking then can you imagine if we all really sharpened and strove to obtain the same sort of skills that you obviously have it's just outstandingly amazing but also applied that to you know the need and the uh the necessity to cut through the white noise of the internet for example fake Absolutely. news news like could you imagine how the real world might look if we actually use th those sorts of research skills to to really drill down and go right note that that article is completely incorrect hmm, this one that's a complete lie and, and, and to really drive that home for your listeners, I'm almost positive every single one of them has posted a news story or something that they've, they've read and they've posted it and, and then immediately had a negative reaction of people going, oh, you've just, you know, spammed something. That's not actually what happened. If you even bothered to look into the history of the thing, you'd know that's not true, but you've just read this, you know, clickbait article and you pass it on going, oh, that's fascinating. That's very interesting. Well, and then could, you've got had the reaction of the people who that's go, right. no, that's yeah. not actually what happened. And yeah. we've all done it. Of course, because the, 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 the article may be interesting in and of itself, whether it's true or not is what yeah. is the, is the issue. Uh, cause and, the, cause if not, if it's, if the truth isn't there, it may still be a cool story, but you have to be able to differentiate between what's his story and or what's true and what's the story. Yeah, no. And anybody who says they're not political, I basically call them an idiot because everything's political in this world. And we like to think science is the least political um, oh, thing you can get into, I wish. but science is so political. Like it's ridiculous. Like how much information is being lost because some people just can't let go of their theory of something and you know, evidence to the contrary. No, that's my theory. I'm sticking to it or I'll, I'll block any information that disproves my theory because that's what got me my grant. Or you could, you could have a hundred thousand people follow you now and say, we like that theory, even, even though the theory can be well and truly proven to be completely inadequate, but they could say, well, I've got a hundred thousand people that are willing to follow me on this one. It's like, yeah, yeah that's not science. Yeah. And that's, but that's the modern social world. media, mo social media. <laughs> well, speaking of the crisscross between science, what is true history and research I have to ask. The Curse of King Tut's Tomb. Now, <laughs> please don't reveal anything about the upcoming sequel, but is there anything interesting you can let myself and our listeners know about King Tut's Tomb? Because I think King Tut's Tomb and Quicksand, they were staples as a kid. Yeah, and it's also the centenary. Howard Carter getting in, I think it was uh, 1922. It shows here the 20s, so I'm assuming we're, we're yeah. about time for 100. So yeah. either this year or next year, it's the centenary of the, the Howard Carter. So pretty much my character, half the fun is trying to work out who my main character is because they are a person from, I don't want to say mythology, but they are a person from history. Right, and they possibly transcend time. Would that be a fair? Yep, yes. yep. they are incredibly old. Yes. And that's the point is that they're so old that they're bored. And so this guy's met and 
basically, so if I go back to the first book, the, the idea was my two main characters are kind of Sherlock Holmes and Watson. And so when any, anything uh, Sherlocky happened, Arthur Conan Doyle's with them, helping them explore this event. And anything Sherlocky happens, Doyle's like, oh, that's a good idea for a story. Aha, uh -huh, feeding off each other. And if other. anything dracula happens, <laughs> Stoker's right next to him going, oh, that's a good, good idea for a story. And so the story is also based on their writings as well because they wrote their versions of what was happening. Uh, so, yeah, so my guy's ancient, he's bored, he's basically Sherlock Holmes, and he's just using his mind. Like, if you live that long, a bit like myself, you gather information and you have l many strands of information and you, you, you seed, you have to garden your information. You're like a gardener. You're always exploring resources and, and finding facts that you know will come back sometime. So put it in your little mind palace and it'll come out at some point. And so basically uh, this guy is reading a newspaper about the missing penis of King Tut in the 1960s which is an absolutely true story. Yes, yeah, and it sounds like very important news too. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. that is a mystery that has to be solved, especially for someone who believes in eternal life that is not going to be just uh, ignored. No, um, especially seeing he then recalls the time in 1920s when he was at, he was in the background of one of the photos of Howard Carter breaking into uh, the tomb and what people don't realize, or a lot of people may not realize, is that the tomb was broken into the night before the official entry. So basically Howard Carter wasn't allowed to enter the tomb until the, uh, the um, division of Egyptology, the actual Egypt division of Egyptology had a representative there. And clearly what he did was like, screw that. I've not spent all this money to wait. <laughs> so that night they snuck in, had a look, and then covered it up, hoping nobody would notice, is what we assume happened. Uh -huh. But my story is my main character is freaking out that this thing, this tomb that he hoped would never be uncovered because it was such a minor tomb hidden in such a bizarre place that nobody would ever get in there, that he had hidden something in there and he has to get that out before Carter and his team gets in. Right. Okay. So what is that thing he's hidden in there? Well, this is, this is for the readers to find out, isn't it? Yeah, and then like it, it develops into like he he recounts the time he was with Bon. Why did Bonaparte go to Egypt? It's the biggest mystery, and we now know why. But at the time, it kind of made no sense. Why did Napoleon, who wasn't the emperor at the time, he was just a general, invade Egypt? Like it, it just made no sense. And then why did Alexander the Great invade Egypt? And we know why because it was the at that time the peak of civilization. They thought and. You know, if you controlled Egypt, you controlled the, basically that part of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's something's happening at those points of time and the world's greatest powers, basically my character's getting to them going, look, we've got to get in there because we've got to stop this. This thing's going to happen. And if we don't get in there now, we're in trouble. The world is in trouble. And so they're going, they're basically invading these places to stop this event from happening over and over and over again because it keeps popping back up. So that's the, it kind of goes through the history of my main character remembering the times when he was with Alexander and why they went into Egypt. Like um, uh, the, the most famous Egyptian is Cleopatra and Cleopatra was a Ptolemy. She was, Ptolemy is um, Alexander the Great's best friend who when he died, uh, there became a big power struggle in Macedonia and whoever controls Ma uh, Alexander's body controls the empire because he never put anybody in charge. He never said who his successor was. And so it became a big battle to try and get control of Alexander's body. And this main Malik, uh, other general, uh, one of Ale Alexander's generals, took the body and was heading back to Macedon to basically go, look, I've got the body, I'm in charge. And Ptolemy actually intercepted that uh, body on the way, stole it, raced back to Egypt and created the Ptolemy Empire. And so it's actually, so she's Greek. Cleopatra is Greek. It kind of makes me think of Alexander's body being an amulet in the way of the, is it the Spear of Destiny, the, the theory yes, for Hitler's yeah. rise to power from, yep. the, from the spear that he now... Or, or raised the lost ark with the uh, tomb. Yeah. <laughs> with the, yeah. Um, with the um, ark. <laughs> ark of the Covenant, yes. Uh, whoever holds it will have power. But 
to, to use that as a transition, because I'd, I'd love to talk about something that I'm sure is very exciting for you, uh, assuming the dates are right, it hasn't quite been released yet, but so we, we've got uh, an ancient Egyptian amulet and it reminds me of the, the Hitler's amulet with the sword, uh, sorry, the sword that pierced Christ's side. You're the historian, cause, so you definitely had to point me out if I'm wrong, but it was just after World War One that Hitler chased down that sword, wasn't it? And that was the theory that that was how he rose to power. Is that right? It wasn't so much Hitler. Hitler was, like, from all the things I've been able to read, Hitler just didn't give a crap. But he was very politically savvy and knew he could use these things. Oh, okay. It so, was, um, so it still it worked. The, yeah, oh, absolutely. No, it was uh, Himmler. Himmler oh, was okay. absolutely the one who believed in the Aryan race and, and controlling the, all these artifacts. And so, you know, he's basically the third most powerful Nazi. Yes. And he's the one who created all this mysticism around the Nazis. And Hitler was just savvy enough to tap into that. Like he went, oh yeah, well, it's not stopping me from doing what I want. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. A, they were sending teams all over the place. They were trying to find stuff. Oh, um, raiding museums, weren't they? And art galleries? Yeah, like, well, art galleries, you know, there's, you know, the stories really coming out about what they did there, but yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and it wasn't just them. Like, um, Napoleon did it as well. Napoleon was such a scientist. Uh, one of the most famous fossils in the world is the monster of Maastricht, which, which was a Mosasaur. If you watch the Jurassic world movie, it's that giant marine reptile that was swimming in the oceans in the, the last couple of Jurassic world movies. Um, the very first one was found in, um, uh, um, Maastricht, which is, uh, basically the Netherlands. And so when Napoleon invades that, he actually had his troops go in, steal that fossil, and it's still on display today in uh, Paris. They won't oh, give it back. Oh, far out. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because it was this amazing fossil, and he went, I want that fossil. <laughs> yeah, it must be mine. <laughs> but no, the reason why I brought into the, or, or brought up the, the, the war stuff is, obviously, uh, I, I understand, and forgive me if I've got the date wrong, but I understand on March 16, a new book by yourself is being released called now, I hope I pronounce this right, Golgotha. Uh, gold, well, I say Golgotha, but I, I, I'm pretty sure both are correct. Well, my first inkling was Golgotha as in Gothic, but every, every time I try and get it right, I, it's always the other. So I thought, I'll, I'll do it the other way. But So Golgotha, sorry, let's try that again, Golgotha. And yeah. it, it's described as a World War I trench murder mystery and based on a rumour of a soldier being found in no man's land, crucified to a church door, and that an act that was, threatens to cause a mutiny in the trenches. That is a very, very profound and interesting concept and, and instantly carries a huge amount of symbolism and, and uh, very daunting promises. Can you tell us a little bit about it? To sure. Say, yeah, that'd be fantastic. But, because so, so again, all true. So the rumours of allied soldiers going into no man's land and discovering one of their soldiers crucified to a barn door, a church door, a tree, like it does change. And that's the problem. It changes, which makes it right. probably more myth than it's like uh, uh, um, whispers where, you know, they start off of one story, quickly morphed into another story. There is no evidence at all this actually happened. Although very recently um, the, there's a very strong suggestion it did happen and it's a Canadian soldier because they found some letters that uh, some soldiers that were in this guy's platoon wrote back to his family going, yeah, sorry about Dave. This is what happened to him. But, but for our story, there's, and for a long time, there was no evidence, but the problem was the, 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 the ramifications of that myth were great because especially the French, the French weren't happy at the time. The French army was always near rebellion and they were seriously so pissed. They were threatening to charge forward with no um, rhyme or reason, just charge forward to take revenge on the Germans. Obviously war is absolutely atrocious and yep. World War I is probably one of the most atrocious wars in, the, in our you know, species history. And yet there what, were rules. And of course there were rules. But so was, what, was the, what was it about being... Uh, crucified to is it because it was a church crucifixion on church door as in one telling of the story i think it ruffled? probably had something different to every single person and so like if you're if you're a catholic you don't like the symbolism if you're you're worried about your mates who've just been through brutality and i think that's the point is that for me it sounds like it was one one brutality too many 
the straw like it was violent donkey's back yeah it was a specific violent act against a specific person rather than the generalized mayhem of war at the time which is you're just shooting your guns and you don't even know if you're hitting anyone these guys who did this deliberately found a guy and deliberately did that act it's kind of the the, the, the initial impression that it makes on me is um that you know like you said there, there was in theory rules to the war back then and there was nothing pleasant about the whole affair but uh, but ultimately it was you know it, at least in the trenches it was men fighting men and that there was a basic rule system and it, there was a certain purpose to the war as far as the idea well, of the what, time or, whereas or, this may be almost like a serial killer's uh note in the middle of it just to yep. make things worse and and specifically also what i should probably mention is there were trench rules so one of the things was um your bayonet your knife like a lot of the allied armies for just a very short time they actually started giving their soldiers knives with a serrated edge because that will clearly puncture and create create a horrendous wound mm. and very quickly in the trenches any soldier who was found carrying one of those knives was not handled nicely they were brutalized for having having such a like that was taking it too far and so a, a, a kind of trench rule book arrived that when you know we're in this together you know you, your politicians are sending you there my politicians are sending us here doesn't mean we have to be dicks yeah that, but this, that makes sense and that's what i mean like it was it was literally in it wasn't that it wasn't the officers and it wasn't the national representatives it was the individual soldiers who were in that crap just went that is taking it way too far it's it's, it's and, in essence taking any dignity away from the process of yep. death. Yeah. And it became such a problem that the, the, the HQ, like Haig and all those guys, really had to try and stamp it out. Like they, they had to create, treat it as an issue because they, they were afraid like every time the allies go forward, any prisoner is just going to get killed because they're just so angry at this that they're not going to, the, the, any sort of rule books out the window. And, and then the troops become quite un, unusable. You can't control them when they're like that. And so, and that you need to put some discipline back into the soldiers. And, and um, so there was a reaction to it, even though there's no evidence that it ever happened. The, the reaction to that event, that myth was so strong that it did have a reaction. Like it was, a, it, it did create a, tr a real event. And so I've always thought, well, geez, there's a story there. Absolutely. A fascinating one. At the um, very least. And, and I love, um, Again, you may notice I like using various media. I love Orson Welles' The Third Man. And The Third Man said at the end of, in Vienna, at the end of the Second World War, where the French, the British, the uh, Russians, and the Americans have basically taken over Berlin and, and Austria. And none of those trust each other. So they, they're actually, they, they actually had police patrols going out at night into the city just to make sure there's no crimes happening but each patrol would be a member from each army oh i see yeah so you'd have a, an american soldier a british soldier a french soldier and a russian patrolling together because they didn't trust each other well it wasn't exactly a global time of trust was it no so that i in the back of my head i went well how cool would that be is if um for the the to, to try and settle the armies down that the, the uh, commanders went to each army and went, right, you guys get to choose a representative and they have to have some policing background and they are going to investigate this crime because you don't trust us and you will never trust anything we say, but you will trust one of your own. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you each get a representative and they will investigate the crime and they will tell you the results. That is uh, yeah, very, very intriguing. And look, that is probably a title I'm definitely going to be grabbing. It's a very strange time. Like, um, because of COVID and things like I've literally got two books coming out within weeks of each other from two different publishers. Like, you know, so I've got the other one horror about the 1950s comics as well, the reaction to comics. And that just came out like a week ago. So, wow. so like, it's like, I, I deliberately had them coming out so far apart that like you can, I could concentrate on each individually and they've both come out within basically weeks of each other well if it doesn't rain a pause but yeah. for, for our listeners and for myself where can we get all these great titles always amazon if you look at amazon like um 
you know, it's Marcosi Publications for the comic one and Odyssey Books for the all the others. Um, but if you go onto my author page on Amazon, like, um, you know, I've, I've written short stories and I've written magazines and, and there's so much of that stuff is just all on my author's page. You can see it all. So um, if you just look up Golgotha Phil Hoare, um, I'm sure you'll find it. And then you can just click on the Phil Hoare link and it'll show you everything there. We'll um, definitely be putting all the links we can as part of the episode notes on the, on the Australian Book Club's website with relation to the podcast. So if anybody out there didn't get a chance to jot anything down with a pen, by all means, just jump onto our website under the uh, show notes and you'll be able to find all the links so that there's no opportunity to miss out if you're in, in, interested in any of Phil's books. But I'll tell you what, judging by the, the style of writing, the, your love of history and obviously your profession and career history, there is simply no running out of tales for you to tell. And I, I suspect we're going to be getting a lot of books from you over the next few years. Yeah, like um, later this year, there'll be another one, The Bizarre Natural History of Australia, which is all those tales we were just kind of hinting at, all these weird things that were happening in and around Australia, like the missing fleet and, and the, uh, the, you know, the um, Australia's Titanic and things like that. Um, the, just bizarre events were happening around here and just nobody seems to know about them. So I'm determined to change that. You are bringing the spotlight to what the real history, the real truth and the real bizarre nature of our reality. And for I that... I do t tilt my hat. That's amazing work. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and so, and, and that was, sorry, that Bizarre History of Australia, that's due later this year. So we're we talking. That, uh, that one's going to be self-published. So that's whenever I can get it out. Like I've got it all there. I'm just editing at the moment. And unfortunately, I keep discovering stuff. Like I just discovered a new event that I'm like, like the Australian mammoth, which is just impossible and yet true. So and that, that story alone has Napoleon, um, has Thomas Jefferson, has Charles Darwin, like all these things. And it's all linked to this one fossil that was discovered in Australia. Wow. Okay. Phil, I, I can't ask you to promise, but I would be honoured and very happy if you would agree to, or at least in, in pencil in the opportunity to talk to you again, uh, perhaps when the titles, some of the other titles come out, because I could literally talk forever. Uh, and every time, every thread you bring up is a whole new adventure or excitement that I want to get into. So uh, there's much more that I'd love to learn from you and, and learn about you and about your writing and about your stories than we can possibly fit in one podcast, especially considering we haven't even touched on your two million word history, <laughs> history epic. <laughs> can, can, you tell ridiculous. Me, can you tell me at least does it have a title? Uh, well, it was called um, uh, Collisions or... Uh, the the uh, the history of Australia from the the fall of the Roman Empire to Gallipoli. Okay, because it literally is one story. So so in essence, it's a global history uh, from an Australian point of view. Or yep, well, it's all the events that were happening. Uh, so just real quick, like um, yeah, go ahead, George please. George Washington becomes famous because he wasn't the president; he was a British officer, and he was sent. He was in charge uh, back then which is why he always wear a red coat because he was a British officer before he became anything American because they were colonies of England and the French were in Canada. And so there's a, a battle called the battle of Jumonville Glen, which literally starts the seven years war. Uh, there's a, a, an Indian, a native American who's basically talking to, to Washington going, the French are coming down here. They're coming to kill you. So you better set up a trap and get them. And so they set up this ambush and as the French walk past, they, they kill them all, but they didn't. And the, 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 the officer that was in charge of the French is basically in French going, why did you attack us? We were coming to talk why you were here. And Washington is looking at the French officer who doesn't speak French going, why did you attack us? We were coming to talk to you. Why did you come into this oh, no. buffer zone called Ohio? And uh, it's actually the, the Native American can see them talking and realizes they're probably going to work things out. And he wants both to fight because if the French kill each the British and the British kill the French, the Native Americans take over. Yeah. It's, it's and so he, he lit, and this is true, he walks up behind the French officer, pulls out his tomahawk, slices his head open like a boiled egg, reaches in, washes his hands in the guy's brains, all in front of Washington, who's watching this with horror, and basically goes, yeah, let's say you make peace now. Fine. And that, that, that crime triggers the French-England war, which eventually sees France kicked out of Canada, which then eventually sees the Americans kicking the British out of America, which then leads directly to 
Ta-da. The of Australia. Yes. All from the uh, impact of a tomahawk. Yeah. This one single murder. So that's what we can expect in the two million story? Yeah. Oh. Well, it, it's so big, I probably won't publish that as a book. I'll probably start no, releasing it's... them as online single events and then tie it all together at the end. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's probably a whole series in there. Uh, yeah. Which, so, which is like the, um, and, and that's, that's the, re, the, the, the response I keep getting. So there's another lesson for your up and coming authors. Publishing houses don't want big sweeping epics. They want individual events or individual peoples. So they want biographies or biographies of an event. Anything f more fast scope reaching than that, they're not interested. So they don't want a general history of the first world war because there's 20,000 of those books and you're not probably going to say much new. No, that's correct. Yeah. And they don't sell. No, uh, whereas a biography of, you know, some guy who did some thing, that's more likely going to be like, uh, the, like one of the things I've got in my head is the Australian colony in Africa. Most people don't know, realize Australia colonized Africa and it was a short term colony that just failed miserably. But that event would be a gr really good book. That's the thing they kind of want. Yeah. Um, so this thing's just, I was just writing it for myself. Like I just kept finding stuff and I just, I just couldn't stop. It was just all this real stuff. I'm like, no, 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 this can't be real. This can't be real. And just for myself learning about these things, I was more inquisitive and kind of just kept building on it and building on it and building on it. It just became ridiculous. It, there's a, an Australian invasion of Chile to support the last Incan emperor. I'm like, who the hell's ever heard of that? No, no, I've never heard of that. <laughs> and like all these things. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> so as you said, these are all individual events, which we can talk about or I can talk about and then kind of say at the end, now yeah, this led to that, which led to that, which led to that, which led to that. And yes. that guy is the guy who did this and then did that. <laughs> you put all the pieces on the board, you zoom back and realize it's a very familiar picture and you go, wow. Very familiar. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, where do you do the majority of your research? Do you, uh, are you a library, so, microfish? You know, all, everywhere, you know, like everywhere, main, everywhere. Like um, wherever I can get into. Uh, like, so when I was in working at the Smithsonian, I got myself, I was very lucky. I got a Library of Congress card and I was in the Library of Congress constantly. Um, so it's the biggest library in the world. Yeah, that, that would so, be absolutely magical. But the magic thing is a lot of universities, and especially in Australia today, Australia is like almost leading the world in this sense. They're printing everything online. So Trove is one of the greatest resources on the planet. Yes. Yeah. The National Library's digitized newspapers and they're word searchable. <laughs> so that immediately gives you a resource that not many people are going through at the moment. And especially if you can get on a subject that isn't a popular subject, you are going to be the first person going through that stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, I've, I've had a little bit of a fiddle with Trove, um, but, but from, from my experience, it's one of those things that is capable of so much and it just takes a very short term for you to get the knack of how to use it, how, you know, yep. what terms to search for, et cetera. But for, for those listeners out there that haven't played with Trove, uh, definitely jump online and Google T-R-O-V-E. And uh, if you're looking to do research, definitely it's a unique tool. Uh, yeah. And again, you're dealing with newspapers and every newspaper has a political point of view. Of course. So when you find it, use that as another source of something to research. Don't take that as your first account. Yeah. And hey, look, it may be for many of us the first time and that you'd actually sit down and look through a newspaper in yep. today's technology uh, especially so, especially in this modern world yeah so it could be a fun venture but like you said it's excellent for research but still there's always like and you, know, you brought this up earlier in the podcast question the source you but, know, and, but, and know when to trust it and feel comfortable when you know you maybe shouldn't and a great thing for everyone and this isn't just like people who want to write a book this is for everyone you all have things in your history events in your history that were probably recorded in a newspaper somewhere. So I'd kind of forgotten. I used to work in a comic book shop in the, in, um, in uh, Canberra in the nineties that actually blew up. <laughs> like the, we had a bakery next to us and it turned oh, out okay. to be an arson event. I was going to say, was it like some sort of, uh, you know, deliberate or you, so you're a victim yeah, of someone's deliberate. deliberate attempt. Yeah. It was my very first day in charge. Like, um, the two guys who owned it had just exhausted themselves over months and they gave me the keys and went, okay, you're opening tomorrow. Don't call me unless the shop blew up. 
and I got off the bus walking up to the shop and there's all these cops and fire engines and everything at the front. Oh, no way. <laughs> it runs right up to our door and I look inside and everything's blown over and <laughs> like we had a safe and it's on its side and I got to do the phone call. So I can visualise that, can visualize that story already in a comic book, walking, yeah. <laughs> going, going through, turn the page, kaboom. <laughs> but I, I, I kind of, because I've been writing this about all this stuff about comics lately, I, I kind of triggered that memory. I'm like, I wonder if I can, if they did a newspaper report about it. And I went back and yeah, there's these newspaper reports. And I think in one of them, you can actually see me in one of the photos of the thing. So I'm like, oh, yeah. So think of your own history. You might be able to find something about yourself or your parents. So just for the fun of just investigating your own history, Trove is a great resource. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing to bring up. And uh, I've got a feeling a lot of people that are listening to this podcast are jotting that down now. And when we're, when they get time, they're going to be jumping on and have a look. I know I'm going to be. I, it's been a while since I've jumped on there. So I might do that again and, and go down the rabbit hole of uh, maybe some 80s history and see what I can find in relation to my life that's a, such yeah, a good j idea j just work out your keywords though some words are so generic <laughs> you are going to get ten thousand hits but you can also do it by date so that helps out a lot you think of the date that you were, the event happened in you can kind of refine it but yeah just try and think of some words that might not trigger too many uh, yeah hits on your research basketball results may give you a bit more than you can handle over a cup of coffee that's true yeah well phil thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of the australian book lovers podcast author interview Anytime. it has been absolutely amazing as i mentioned well, i really hope we can get you back on because there's still a million subjects that we can talk about and that, that there's a lot that i'd like to uh, hear more from from you uh, like but in jack, the meantime, jack the ripper in rockhampton we didn't even get there oh <laughs> yes actually well no i'll tell you what let's not quit just yet because th that's right we were chatting a little bit uh, off air before we started recording and you brought up and during our conversation which went from chicken guts to uh, vhs <laughs> and movies and cinemas and comics somehow we got to uh you mentioning that there's the theory or the reality that jack the ripper was in rockhampton so we'll go a little bit longer because yes i'm, I'm sure that there's listeners out there that are just as curious as i am and so thank you for reminding me please how on earth do we arrive at this concept that Jack the Ripper was in good old Rockhampton? Okay, so uh, one of Australia's more famous serial killers, who I literally can't remember his name at the moment, uh, he was killed in Melbourne in 1901. He was uh, hung. Uh, the Kind of how I came into this story is I was working at the National Film and Sand Archives, and the National Film and Sand Archives is actually a building that was built to house the Australian Anatomy Collection. Oh, okay. And so all the floors in the basement all have a slant to them so that the blood from autopsies will run down the floor. And it's just full of all these weird little features. And in the main, and please go to the National Film and Sound Archives in, uh, in uh, Barton, in, uh, in Acton, in Canberra. It's amazing. But in the foyer, there's all these busts of famous scientists like Darwin and Lessier and all these amazing things who I obviously know a lot about because that's my history. But I started looking at some of them going, that's not a bus, that's a death mask. And what, what would differentiate the two? A death mask is literally a mask that was a uh, plaster mask taken off the dead face of a oh, I see what you're person saying, in yeah. history. That's so quite, it's yeah. like, it's literally the dead face of a serial killer or a famous person. There's a famous Napoleon death mask getting around. But that me to this story, which is um, this guy, and, and people might know this, the famous story about Ned Kelly, like, his, his head was stolen for a while. Like some people actually broke into a museum and stole his skull. Oh dear. Wasn't his skull. It was this guy's skull. Okay. <laughs> um, and that was at typical the, Australian, uh, robbers or criminals. Yeah, yeah, they got the wrong skull. <laughs> Getting the um, wrong stuff. Yeah. But that was at the Australian anatomy when, which is the current national film and sound archives. And when we look into the history of, the, uh, I think it's named, his name's Seeley. I want to say it's named Seeley, S-E-W-L-E-Y. -E uh, when we look into his history, he was in Rockhampton. For, he, like, he, he killed a bunch of people. He killed his family. He killed, like, yeah, he, he killed some people. Um, and when it was such a famous story that that story and his photo got into the papers in London. And everybody in Whitechapel started looking at this photo going, that's him. That's the guy I saw. That's the guy. All these eyewitnesses were still alive in oh, 1901. Oh, you're kidding. 
because it's only 1881, so it's only 20 years, and they're looking at this photo going, holy crap, that's him. And when we look into this guy's history, he was in Whitechapel at the time, or at least in that general vicinity that he could have been in Whitechapel at the time. So this serial, uh, serial killer or this person that was hung in, I think, 1901, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do we know, so this gentleman was, for want of a better word, was he Australian born or was he? I oh, know he's English. So, so he, he, he was English and come over, right? Yeah. So he, like one of the, one of the murders was he had a family in London. He left here. He came here to make his money. He, he traveled to a bunch of different places. We think he committed murders in some of those places as well. Uh, but he got here, met a girl, started a new family. She didn't know about the old family. Uh, things started to get very stressful with that new family. So he killed them. You know, there's a whole bunch of very sordid things that he got up to. But yeah, but just when we track his history, there is like even um, London, even the Metropolitan Police today still say he is an incredibly strong prime suspect. That is just unbelievable. And yeah. kind of sending a little bit of a chill up my spine because, you know, we all grew up with this Jack the Ripper and all these different versions and all the different tales but but nonetheless it's a he's a specter that sort of has loomed over since i was a kid and to think that maybe he his murderous rampage you know crossed the oceans and ended up here that is just mind-boggling yeah um, and is there is that a theory in in progress at the moment or is there is there books written I, on I, that I, theory I, or I is that something I you're going to be working on uh it's uh, like I, I feel like i've done my jack the ripper book yeah, but, but what about this is, uh, as a non-fiction? Possibly, but like what it is going to be, however, is like I'm talking to the Rockhampton Council at the moment um, because I'm obviously a professional tour guide and a professional talker um, and they want some heritage walks. They've, they've got a lot of events that happen in Rockhampton, like uh, Beef Week is coming up and um, a lot uh, Summer Nats, the, the, the big car event that oh, happens yes. in Canberra. They're actually ha having a, a clone event from Summer Nats, so it's a Summer North or something, I think it's called, uh, is happening in Rockhampton. So they're going to have a lot of tourists in the area and they want to do some heritage walks. And that we're, I've basically been talking to them going, you know, like, can you come up with a walking tour of the central CBD? And I went, sure, I'll talk about Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> so they got no idea. About well, they, they, they were shocked. Yeah, they, they, they had not heard that at all. So, like, it's reasonably com like jack the ripper is like saying people like people who get into napoleon really get into napoleon he's a well that you just fall down because it's so rich and it's so interesting and the same with jack the ripper if you become a ripologist it's a kind of well that you don't get out of so I, it's a pretty common kind of story in those circles but for everyone else no, nobody's ever heard this before just out of curiosity when do you think or do you know when that seed of an idea first came about who who first put one and one together is it something that's been around uh, for years like no no I, th I think it was right from the hanging like it was literally the reaction of s survivors and and eyewitnesses in Whitechapel in 1901 seeing in the paper this guy's photo and going that's him <laughs> but sure yeah you think surely you'd think that would bring some that would have echoed with some sort of traction throughout through the next and, hundred and, and so it did. years it, 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 it became an interesting thing at the time but then unless people keep following it Life up moves on yeah yeah you know that's also the time of the boer war and now you're kind of leading up to um the 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 war looming between um america and japan which threatens to bring in england on japan's side and germany on america's side and that's why um um Teddy Roosevelt sends the Great White Fleet on this giant mission around the world to kind of project American sea power. But what they're actually doing is while they're in Sydney, they were mapping down all our, because we're obviously England, they're mapping all our gun emplacements and they were very well prepared to invade Australia because we would come in on Japan's side. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot going on at that time that yeah, I can see why, well, that's interesting, but we've got other things to think about. Well, I can uh, guarantee you one thing. I'm going to be looking into the Rockhampton Dracula, oh, Dracula, the Rockhampton yeah. Jack the Ripper um, theory uh, later tonight. Absolutely.
we've talked about so much. I, I don't know how Dracula popped into that one um, because I'm I've got my, skills. I've got mad. I can shoehorn anything into anywhere. Yeah, because in my in, as I'm talking to you in my head, I've got that that sort of hunchbacky picture in my mind of Jack the Ripper it's from some sort of some yeah, point. so one of those so, famous so, old pictures. Yeah, the black and white silhouette style. Um, it's in my head, so I don't know how Dracula came out from that one. <laughs> but uh, but that read is, my book, read my novel. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And for everybody who is interested, and I can't imagine anybody out there listening to this isn't interested. Uh, the Brotherhood of the Dragon is you can find the listing on AustralianBookLovers.com. But as I mentioned, we're going to put show notes for this episode, which will include links to all of Phil's online stuff, so that you can absolutely jump in, click, and find any books that are available as well as learn more about his fascinating lifestyle and career. And look, at the time of recording, the Australian government is just looking at uh, subsidising travel for Australians, for interstate travel, to try and boost our local economy. A lot of those flights are going into Queensland. So if you are heading towards Rockhampton, then maybe in the future, go to the local council or the local visitor centre and ask about a Jack the Ripper walk and see if anything's been set up. You just may be surprised and it may just be a very odd, unique and fantastic opportunity to meet author Phil Hoare. Yeah, I'll come out to the Capricorn Caves. I'll give you a tour of the caves. Oh, there we go. Capricorn Caves. So that's where you can find him. Uh, and how often, how many days a week is the tours take part up there? Uh, they're on on the hour every day and i'm usually there like three maybe four days a week and uh -huh. usually over the weekend so but yeah if you want to if you want to take one of my tours just ring up and they'll tell you which days i'm there well there you go so anybody heading to rockhampton or to queensland who are going to go via rockhampton through rockhampton or might be over there and decide to do it off the, off the cuff visit to rockhampton go and visit phil have a chat, and I have no doubt, as you can tell by this conversation, that he will keep you fascinated and entertained for hours. Phil, thank you so much for your time today. And thank I you really do me. really do hope we talk again soon. All the best to you, sir. Thank you. Take care. This chapter is brought to you by The Brotherhood of the Dragon, an Armand Galeas and Sebastian Volk mystery. Book one in the Bloodline Trilogy. The Brotherhood of the Dragon is available at Odyssey Books and on Amazon. Now before I begin, I'll admit I am reading two chapters here, as I try to keep this book fast paced and punchy, so the chapters are short and rather tight. Chapter four. My head hurt. Actually, my head had already been hurting before my run in with the flat end of the shovel. It had been hurting ever since I woke up in bed in what was now starting to feel like days ago. What I meant to say was my head was no longer simply sore. It was now a source of complete and utter misery. It felt as though the shovel had split my skull in two, and it was still sitting there, like some handyman's Excalibur, waiting to be drawn out by the true King of England. Before my vision swam the face of my attacker. For some strange reason, he looked concerned. Are you kidding around, Amon? Did I hit you too hard? Though a reply formed, it somehow got lost on the way out. Blog, Mina, where is it? Come on, I did not hit you that hard. Frizzberger, Bill what? Hmm, <laughs> maybe I did hit you too hard. Though most of my motor functions seemed to have deserted me, the sharp pain in my head kept my mind focused enough to keep an eye on what my attacker was up to. He first got up and looked about, perhaps to make sure his ambush had remained unseen, and there was no one rushing to my rescue. Next, he returned to my side and removed a small tobacco tin from his top pocket. This he opened, and from within removed a butterfly, very similar to the one I had seen earlier during my walk with Robin Stamford. The gardener took the insect and, forcing my mouth open with his left hand, placed it on my tongue. He then clamped one incredibly powerful fist over my mouth and nose, and almost politely said, Swallow! As hard as I tried to squirm from under his grip, the man effortlessly held me in place. Swallow, he said again, with more force. Already I could feel the fragile creature's body dissolving in my mouth as my body tried to dislodge the irritant by drowning it in saliva. I could feel the harder parts rubbing against the roof of my mouth and then starting to migrate down my throat as the butterfly disintegrated. Swallow it, the man said again, sensing my attempt to resist disappearing along with what air was in my lungs. For God's sake, I'm on, just swallow the damn thing. Finally, my chest heaved and spasm as blissful unconsciousness approached. 
Just before I blacked out, I felt my throat automatically swallow, and once my attacker was sure I had not somehow faked everything, he released me. With a gasp, fresh cool air flooded my lungs, and my amnesia melted away like, well, like a butterfly on your tongue. Chapter 5 Though I rarely intervene in the activities of men, somehow enough people know about my past to ensure I still receive visitors in distress, hoping I have some knowledge or advice that could help them survive their time of need. Most are just lazy people with lazy issues, and those I happily send away. Occasionally something or someone appears with a tale to tell that catches my attention. In these instances, I am happy to help. The world can be a dull place at times, so a new challenge or even just something to pass the time is a jewel to be treasured. If you are of the opinion that the butterfly was some magic potion that gave me back my memory, you are correct. I hate insects. I hate every kind of insect, but very specifically, I hate butterflies. Certainly they look pretty, and that is their evil genius. Underneath the gaudy colours and great luminous wings lies a filthy creature of coarse hair and black spider-like bodies. Have you ever looked closely at a butterfly's head? I mean really closely. Those enormous alien eyes, the giant proboscis that makes them look more like the drinker of souls in some 13th century religious manuscript about the tortures of hell rather than something little girls like to draw on their bedroom walls. Butterflies are the painted strumpets of the animal kingdom, and I do not trust them, not one little bit. The horror and disgust of having the incarnation of evil in my mouth helped destroy the intellectual block I had placed in my mind days ago. After so many years, I had become a creature of habit and lazy days. I have always tried to avoid work, confrontation or stimulation where I could, but to remain living in the style I have grown accustomed to, well, that requires money. This of course means that when I do work, I do so to get paid so I can go right back to my comfortable chair and my books. Like any skill, knowledge requires upkeep, and I need time to remain the genius I believe myself to be. The fellow who stood over me was Sebastian Volk, and we had known each other for a long time. Certainly, he did not like everything I did, and I was none too happy about his success with the ladies, a problem, and his inability to gamble, not so much a problem, but an ongoing tragedy that threatened to doom us both. Not only did Volk bring his own unique gifts to our acquaintance, he was also of such a great age that he too was often up for an adventure to alleviate the boredom that came with being immortal and idle. His association with me ensured he got plenty of that. He was what you would perhaps call a friend. I wouldn't though, as I had little time for the man, but you may well consider us as such. Feeling better? Volk asked, hauling me to my feet with little effort, then patting my backside down as though as a clumsy child. I know this is a little earlier than you asked but things seem to be progressing too fast for you to be lying about in bed. Taking my first unassisted steps, Volk guided me down one of the rear paths to a section of the garden that seemed unused. As we walked, he filled me in. I joined the ground staff like you suggested, and what a miserable lot they have turned out to be. Most of them are discharged soldiers who served with the general, though recently several older men have retired and been replaced by men who had served with the colonel. Most are as mean as the day is long, and none of them know the first thing about gardening which is probably the only reason I got the job. As we neared an enormous brick wall that I assumed ran the perimeter of the estate, the old dog pointed out a large pile of rubbish and what looked like a discarded barn door. What I want to show you is under there, and as far as I can tell, no one I have encountered has had anything to do with it. Unsure what it was, I approached the slab of wood carefully and tilted the door up by one corner. Underneath was a shallow pit, and about two feet down was the body of a man. Well, I assumed it was a man and circumstances would later prove me correct. These chapters were brought to you by The Brotherhood of the Dragon, available at Odyssey Books and on Amazon. The music is by Ben Sound, and you can see more at his website www.bensound.com. So there you go, that was Phil Hoare, and his amazing uh, mind and book of knowledge is, is like a Wikipedia. He was all over the place. I listened and had notes that you wouldn't believe the, the topics and bits and pieces that had jumped to and from. So it must have been really fabulous to have a chat with him. Oh, it was indeed. It, it was just sitting back. And like I said, it, it felt like being taken on a tour, which was, uh, you know, just so much fun. And, you know, like I don't usually pop down notes but if i had writing writing notes i probably would have dropped my pen in confusion but when i wrote down uh 
Jack the Ripper slash Rockhampton, that would have been where the disconnect happened in my mind. Because yes. been, how can that actually, what do those two <laughs> phrases have? Where do they meet? And of course, yeah. as we just heard, there, there's the whole rabbit hole there to go down. Now, I did do a little bit of research after the interview. And mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. That is a very, very strong theory. So, you know, that's just one tiny little shard of crystal from, from the interview that, you know, uh, our listeners may want to explore more. But if there's one thing I took from the conversation with Mr. Phil Hoare, that is how passionate he is for history and the art of research. And yes. it really gave me a whole new level of respect and excitement about it. it. It's really made me change, you know, a bit of a cognitive shift in the way I imagined what history is. Mm-hmm. And he really made history sound like something that was living and breathing there. You just have to know how to tap it yeah, as opposed fantastic. to just dusty, dusty papers to, to read through. So, yeah. yeah. So, so thank you so much, Phil, for an amazing interview. And for our listeners out there, the Brotherhood of the Dragon, which can be found under our horror section. And for a brief description of that, it is 1881 London. A series of murders around Whitechapel have two very old friends investigating the death. Soon, they're joined by Arthur Conan Doyle and Bram Stoker, and all end up fighting for their survival as an ancient horror rises and threatens to destroy the world. And that's book one in a series, so there's definitely some uh, new... Uh, material coming? Yeah, new material, mm-hmm. new, new chapters. I new suppose volumes. Think. Volumes, there we go. <laughs> that's coming. the word. <laughs> uh, sometimes you get tongue-tied behind yeah. a microphone. <laughs> and his other fantastic title, uh, which can also be found under horror, now this one's going to be a little bit tricky because it's found under horror and it's called Horror. <laughs> but the long the long title is horror the first time america's paranoia infected the world and that uh, the description is the modern political environment is not the first time america's paranoia infected the world every generation the media is blamed for the unruly behavior of the young in the 80s it was heavy metal in the 90s it was rap and computer games well there was once a time when comic books were branded public menace number one now, that's also found under nonfiction because it is actually a nonfiction. It's, it's an actual uh, study on something that happens every generation where mm. someone needs to be a scapegoat for behavior or at least enjoy the wrath of uh, crazy politicians that, <laughs> you know, while they go on a war, they think a comic book might be something bad. So there you go. But uh, yeah, two fantastic titles. And I'm sure that this is definitely not the last we're going to see of Mr. Phil Hoare. Um, no. So thank you again. And I guess that leads to some quotes now, Veronica, before we let our dear listeners go and listen to a reading and maybe a book review or two. Just a couple of quick ones. And I think that this, uh, based on what you've uh, just been chatting about, this is a quote by the fabulous Oscar Wilde. So as most people will know, or many people, I shouldn't say most, many people will know he was an Irish poet. Uh, His name was actually Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde. Uh, and he was a, a poet and playwright around the late 1800s. So the quote of his that I love, it is what you read when you don't have to that determines what you will be when you can't help it. Oh, okay. So what I'm trying to interpret that when yeah. when you can't help it, as in yes. what, so what that, part of yeah. the uh, behaviour what, what can't be helped? Yeah, when just you spontaneously are asked a question, when you're asked to respond to something, uh, and what he's suggesting is it's what you read when you don't have to. So not Ah. your school books, not your those kind of things, but the things that you fill your day reading, that's going to determine what you will Uh, be when you can't help it, the person that you are rather than your prescribed uh, texts. So the things that... Obviously, you can read things that you find interesting. Yeah, when interesting you and enjoyable and, so, and those kind of things. Like, so they're going to yeah. be at the forefront of your thoughts and your personality. Yes. And yet, <laughs> it also brings me to mind that despite the fact that you love the horror stuff, you are not a horrible person. <laughs> you know, you are. <laughs> Hang on, is that a quote or an observation? <laughs> That's an observation. <laughs> Sorry, listen. But just say that, you know, um, if somebody looked at your CV, you know, a heavy metal band, uh, a horror writer, you might think, oh, this guy's pretty tough. But no, he is a delightful human being, amazingly compassionate, really interested in people. So, yeah, that's my um, stereotyping in my brain uh, that goes, oh, well, that should mean if he's got X and Y, that should mean Z. But it never does. No, no. Well, I mean, look. No offence. When it it comes to dark crimes, I have to throw the scent off somehow. So I think uh, being a a puppy dog. (laughs) No. 
Oh, no, I don't think Yuki would stay with you as long as she has if uh, if that was true. No. She is, she's a gorgeous girl. Yeah. All right. All right, One so for you. Okay, me- so something to do with a little bit of Gothic and a state that we've been talking, or the, the Gothic uh, literature that we've been talking today. And, yes, I rushed these quotes, uh, <laughs> uh, Veronica's will. Not about to be outdone again forgot. and <laughs> drop them in later when he's edited, yes. let's be honest, peeps. <laughs> so I did a quick research, but I like this one. This uh, is by Alan Moore, and it is, Magic is a state of mind. It is often portrayed as very black and Gothic, and that is because certain practitioners have played that up for a sense of power and prestige. Mm. That is a disservice. Magic is very colourful of this, I am sure. Yes, well, I would have to agree with that quote for sure. Although magic can be seen as dark, uh, but no, I'd have to agree that it is much more colourful. Yeah, I've never, again, just my personal perspective, I've never perceived magic as dark. Um, mm. It's always been such a fun, entertaining thing. Uh, there's nothing scary about magic, although I guess I, I guess for me, I sort of separate magic from ritual and spells, which mm-hmm. I think is a little bit different and mm-hmm. you know, when, when used in horror. But, uh, but yeah, there you go. So what okay. is your second quote? Because now that so, I just yeah. realised that the last one wasn't a real quote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is from, this is a very old quote. So this is from Pliny the Elder, who is in fact Gaius Plinius Secundus, called Pliny the Elder. He was a Roman author, a naturalist, and a natural philosopher, naval and army commander of the uh, early Roman Empire. And uh, he was around, around about, you know, 79 AD is when he died. So there you go. True glory consists in doing what deserves to be written, in writing what deserves to be read, and in so living as to make the world happier and better for our living in it. So they did have an idea back then. So where do yes. we lose it along the way? <laughs> I know. But, you know, listening to Phil's interview, it's, it reminded me of, of this quote, absolutely. So I thought he is out there making the world happier and better for being a part of it because he is writing what deserves to be written and, you know, what deserves to be read. And he's putting all of his knowledge and all of his understanding and every experience he has into what he's doing every day. So, yeah. Yeah, and then the passion is just um, yeah, yeah, undeniable. So it's, it's infectious. I, yeah. I, d- I definitely don't think after that interview, I'm the only one that's uh, got a, a renewed uh, understanding of of history and and maybe even a little spark of excitement to start looking into it a little bit more. Like yeah, maybe, just to get know, looking, curious about yeah, yeah, definitely. But so my second quote is a nice, simple, quick one from none other than Edgar Allan Poe. Beautiful. And this is deep into that darkness, peering, long I stood there wondering fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. So if I were to imagine myself standing on the edge of a, a Gothic realm, I think that would be the, some of the words <laughs> that would come into, uh, into my mind because I, I think it's, um, it's almost, it, I read it as just, that, just before that first step into something very foreboding, mysterious and uh, possibly something you're not coming back from. Oh, yes. And Edgar Allan Poe, of course, is the master of that. So, um, yes, every time I just think about the raven, that poem, I just get a little bit shivery. <laughs> but then I remember the, um, I don't know if you've read any of Jasper Ford's works about Thursday Next, who is a literary detective. And she jumps in and out of books in a kind of alternate universe ah, no um, i haven't had the yeah chance. it's fantastic but it's also good if you know history because in the world that ford's created the english are still at war with the russians in the crimea it's been going for more than 100 years so it didn't actually get settled and they don't have airplanes they have the blimps uh, you know so it's just a few little tweaks that are not quite our world but enough that some points in history things went a different way so yeah mm. interesting but of course how would you love to be able to jump into fiction oh yeah well i mean isn't that a good, <laughs> what a good book lets us do but yeah yes. Uh, but yes the uh, the idea of um being able to hit a button and actually step in there would be would be something else which is um in- interesting to say that because uh, i think i was mentioning the other day uh, a good friend of mine and i we have been experimenting playing uh, games in virtual reality. Uh, so we've recently been trialling a new game that's still in development, but essentially you're both standing there and you can go into combat zones and mm-hmm. you talk to each other. I can see his full figure. Obviously it's a computer generated, but he can see me, I can wave, we talk. And, or another one where we're in a hospital 
abandoned hospital and uh, suddenly zombies come running for you, which is terrifying, I might say, because they are real life zombies. Um, but we were <laughs> as opposed uh, to made up ones. Oh no! Sorry, as, <laughs> as opposed to like cartoon style, these oh, were like um, okay, you know, like rendered to look like uh, flesh humans. and blood. Yeah, humans. Right, I'm yeah. with you. Yep. Um, but it, it was so bizarre because I'm standing in a in a ho- abandoned hospital room, um, like in like say the 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 what do you call it the ward the, by the desk, and I turned around and. There's my friend, and I'll talk to him and say, hey, which, which room do you want to go down? And this one, that one, and oh, look out behind you. But when we were talking about it after saying, well, we grew up with like Vic 20 and Commodore 64, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's, it's, it, we were talking about uh, Tap of the Birds stories as well, so very mm-hmm. quickly. But the idea of having a different, you know, transcending time to see the little you or the, the older you. Mm-hmm. So I went back to see myself when I was sitting there playing, I don't know, some ran a choplifter or something on Commodore 64 <laughs> and I said hey guess what you're going to be able to actually go into the games with your friends I'll be like what no way, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there we are we're doing it are, uh, yeah that's it it's no longer science fiction and the, the only reason I bring that up is because there has been some graphic novels that are being turned into virtual reality experiences mm. So it's not far off the mark saying that, that one day we may be able to step into uh, of, of a good book because and, and therefore somehow blend the idea of reading and experience, which mm-hmm. is a very, very exciting concept. I've, I've had a bit of a play with one of the graphic novels. So you actually, the page, you, you read it like a normal book sort of thing, like mm-hmm. the page will be in front of you, but the scene it's describing is beyond the words and it's living mm. and breathing with wind mm. blowing and you know and then if there's an action sequence for example something happens then before the page turns it'll disappear and then you'll be a, you'll be a part of that experience and you're watching it all around you take place and mm-hmm. then the next page comes and so yes stepping into a book i think it may even be possible so <laughs> definitely Yes, but that would it. be really good. Yes, yeah. I'd go into that. I don't think I'd go into the spooky one. So you know, just um, thinking about that about Edgar Allan Poe again. Um, I've heard snippets of Christopher Lee reading The Raven, uh, which you know the one that once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. But you can imagine his words reading that in that beautiful timber that he has in his voice and were books to come to life, that would be, you know, voice would be so important. It just adds a sense, doesn't it? And then if you add image, it's another sense. And then if you add the smell, another sense, then taste. And then what you're experiencing in the virtual reality is that proprioception, which is the sense of balance and where you are in the world. And so they've already immersed those senses. So yeah, it would be amazing. Yes, yes. And f- I think uh, I'll have to find it because I know it exists. Uh, so, because obviously we hope to be able to catch up in real life soon to make yes. <laughs> sit down and discuss all the uh, very important plans moving forward as we yes. grow the uh, the website and the podcast. But the uh, there is, I'm 99% sure, an Edgar Allan Poe reading experience in VR. Oh, so okay. So you get the full reading, <laughs> but instead you're actually Ooh. in in the castle or in the room, Ooh, creaking it, and the yeah. rat, you can, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. It's something to look forward to. <laughs> but there you go, listeners. Now, you know, that my little treat after doing lots, you know, when I'm finishing editing or uh, as in editing the podcast, putting the podcast together or working on the website, I have the VR there because for, it, so for a little 10 minutes, it's my little escape. So you know forgive me when i maybe talk about star wars pinball or vr <laughs> but no uh, the vr is definitely a tool that's going to incorporate books uh there's this is no two ways about it so it yeah. will be very interesting to think so it'd be very interesting to see where that technology leads us and what sort of pathways it takes but, yeah, but nonetheless absolutely. yes so oculus if you want to throw us some free uh VRs, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to uh, spruik it all day yeah, no. we're not supported by anybody at the moment so no, that's no, okay no, no. Yes. no but but uh, yeah so wow what an episode what an interview and uh gothic i like i like the idea of having the opportunity to talk a little bit about gothic especially gothic uh, literature in australia so it's been so much fun it has it has and if you are a reader and you'd like to get some updates and early news and take part in the giveaways, receive our regular newsletter, which is filled with a library full of excellent Aussie authored books, then you can jump onto the website and subscribe either at the book lovers page or the subscribe button is the top 
is at the top of all the, the genre pages as well. So that's www.australianbooklovers.com forward slash booklovers. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, Twitter, we are at Australian Books. Facebook and Instagram, we are at Australian Book Lovers. We would love to see you there. Let us know what you think of the podcast. Uh, leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform. And when all else is done, Darren, we need to remember. we got to, to remember to read more, more Aussie, Aussie books. books. <laughs> that was a pretty good one. <laughs> and good. Uh, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us for another episode. That is absolutely wonderful. It's so great for all of your support. Hope you enjoyed this whopper of an episode. We'll see you at the next episode. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. Let's meet again. When magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.